Welcome everybody to the November meeting of the Mornington Peninsula Astronomical Society, again uh, pre-recorded this month uh, during the COVID-19 uh, lockdown. Uh, the big news in the uh, last month has been, uh, first of all, the loss of the giant Arecibo uh, telescope in Puerto Rico. This is a radio telescope that's been uh, operational now for uh, 57 years, so a very, very long time. It's featured in uh, certainly a couple of movies, such as uh, the piece uh, Brosnan one in James Bond, GoldenEye, and also uh, Jodie Foster in uh, Contact as well. And uh, unfortunately, um, it's a 305 metre diameter dish, which is quite large, um, and which is built over a, a natural sort of sinkhole uh, depression in the, the ground in Puerto Rico, has uh, started to collapse. Uh, the bad thing uh, all started to happen in uh, August when one of the uh, cables that uh, supports a giant 900 ton uh, receiver uh, well above uh, the dish uh, actually came loose. So the cable itself didn't snap, it just um, wrenched out of its socket uh, somehow and it's still not uh, even understood uh, how that could have occurred. Uh, whether or not there was a gust of wind or something uh, is not uh, really known. But what happened back in August is that um, that severely weakened it. So the 900 uh, ton receiver didn't fall down uh, because the other cables were actually designed to um, as a, a fail safe. So in other words, if one failed, uh, they'd be able to uh, look after it. So uh, since August, uh, they started to look at uh, getting a replacement cable for it. Uh, unfortunately, before they managed to uh, uh, determine what they actually wanted and get the money for it, uh, something else actually happened in um, uh, November, earlier uh, this month, and uh, the, in this particular case, one of the main cables gave way. So uh, clearly, uh, in this particular instance, um, it uh, wasn't designed as well for a fail-safe as uh, what they thought. Now, the main cables themselves are um, obviously three and a half inch, uh, about th sorry, three and a quarter inch um, uh, thick. Uh, uh, braided uh, steel, so in other words, uh, lots of individual strands braided together, pretty much like you get in a uh, suspension bridge um, that you might get, say, over a large uh, river or a ravine or the like, and one of those did actually snap. And uh, in early uh, November when that occurred, unfortunately that cable fell down and uh, smashed its way into uh, the surface of uh, the Arecibo dish, which uh, you would uh, have seen on the uh, the front slide of uh, the pack. Unfortunately, the damage is considered to be uh, irreparable. Um, not that it can't be done, it's just that um, it's considered to be far too risky uh, to actually even attempt to repair, let alone uh, assess whether or not um, they can uh, uh, they can fix it. Uh, unfortunately, with uh, the, one of the main cables gone, they're really on a knife edge as to whether the others will uh, uh, fail at uh, any time. And the same would occur with the suspension bridge as well. So the easiest way to bring down a suspension bridge is to cut enough of its cables and it will collapse uh, under its own weight and exactly the same is uh, uh, in store I think for the Arecibo telescope. They would uh, like to decommission it in uh, an orderly manner. Unfortunately, an orderly manner may not uh, be uh, an option for them uh, if it uh, falls down catastrophically in the meantime due to uh, further cable uh, failures, which uh, is highly likely given that uh, they would be carrying far more load than what uh, they were necessarily designed for. So not, uh, not good news in the astronomical world there. Um, the Arecibo telescope is actually an active telescope, so it not only listens to incoming radio waves, uh, and it's not steerable, by the way, it uh, can only look in a certain direction, uh, plus or minus a, a little bit, using clever techniques, but it's also active in the sense that it can transmit radio uh, signals as well, and uh, look at the bounces that come back. And indeed, uh, this telescope has been used very successfully to image uh, distant asteroids that way by bouncing um, radar signals uh, directly off them and uh, listening for uh, the reflection uh, a little bit later. Now there is a, another larger dish uh, in China which is uh, bigger than the Arecibo. This one is actually 500 meters, which is you know, half a kilometer wide, so it's a very, very large area. Uh, unfortunately, it's only a passive receiver, so it has no capability of uh, imaging, for example, distant uh, asteroids or uh, even uh, planets in uh, radio wavelengths uh, at all. 
So uh, the uh, the humble uh, Arecibo telescope has actually survived uh, hurricanes. It's uh, survived earthquakes and uh, several attempts to uh, kill it off budget-wise. But um, something now has uh, actually happened that uh, has indeed sounded the death knell for it, unfortunately. Now, also during the month, uh, it was announced that the third generation of uh, GPS satellites um, are uh, about to start being launched. It will be over a period of uh, a couple of years. And these are replacing the existing um, 24 that are in uh, operation all the time. Um, plus there are an additional seven GPS satellites that can be uh, called in uh, should backup be necessary. So in other words, if one of the 24 is starting to look a little bit wobbly or is uh, starting to fail uh, technically, then it's um, uh, rotated out of service and one of these spare seven are uh, brought in. Uh, now they're all starting to sort of show their age a bit, but um, this uh, this uh, upgrade to uh, the GPS system, which of course everyone has on their uh, phone that um, enables them to use things like Google Maps uh, and the like, uh, quite aside from lots of other uh, uses uh, for uh, positional accuracy as well. Uh, the GPS uh, system these days is actually um, owned and operated by the US Space Command. So in other words, the US military actually runs the GPS uh, for everyone, uh, for those that use uh, GPS. And uh, they've uh, designed um, uh, the replacements to actually be more uh, battle hardy. So in other words, they're meant to be less um, less susceptible by a factor of about eight to um, uh, either unintended or intended uh, jamming attempts or uh, spoofing. And they're also meant to be three times more uh, robust to um, uh, to being uh, overwhelmed by uh, other signals uh, directed at them. So in other words, they, they, they should be transmitting at um, higher power than what they used to, uh, which may or may not actually help you find your uh, way on your, uh, your telephone's uh, maps, uh, depending on what other local features might uh, be around. For example, if you're driving through Melbourne, you might uh, find um, quite readily as you go between um, the uh, large buildings that you're in a shadow area and uh, your phone won't lock on to um, the usually required four satellites. So GPS, uh, the GPS system of satellites or the constellation of satellites they refer to them uh, is meant to be able to have at least four satellites in the sky at any point in time anywhere on earth. That, uh, that was actually the, uh, the design brief. And uh, it's all uh, run out of um, Colorado in the, the USA. Now, each of those um, GPS satellites costs half a billion US dollars to, uh, to build and uh, get up into orbit. Now, interestingly, some of the other countries have their own versions of um, GPS. So Europe has uh, what they refer to as um, their Galileo system which is uh, effectively uh, the same thing. And indeed, this third generation of uh, US GPS satellites uh, are due to be uh, uh, made compatible with that. Uh, they use uh, similar uh, frequencies to uh, the Galileo system. Uh, the Russians have uh, their own system called uh, GLONASS, and uh, the Chinese also have one called uh, Baidu as well. So it's not as if uh, everybody in the world is actually uh, using GPS, but um, probably uh, the majority are uh, at the moment. So first of all, welcome to any new members uh, of the society. I'm sure it uh, will not be long before we get to meet you uh, face to face, hopefully at um, a meeting at uh, the Briars at the uh, observatory. Um, as usual, I'll go uh, briefly through some of the events of the society in the uh, past month and also what uh, is coming um, in the, uh, the near future that we know about. Uh, the main talk today is going to be by um, Harrison Schmidt. Now, Harrison Schmidt uh, visited Mornington uh, many years ago um, to, uh, to give a, a lecture at uh, the race course in uh, Mornington. And he'll be giving a, a lecture about um, how to return to the moon and go on to Mars. And this includes um, his uh, uh, recollections of his time on the moon because he was the 12th and the final uh, person to actually uh, stand on the surface of the moon in Apollo uh, 17. He uh, is a geologist and uh, tonight's meeting is very much on a uh, geology uh, theme and indeed he was the only scientist to uh, stand on the moon uh, so far. So uh, it's an interesting talk and also looks forward to how we uh, go back to the moon and uh, go on to Mars. 
Then we'll have uh, Sky for the Month by uh, um, Mark Stevens, and also Sky Murphy will talk about rocks, uh, bones and tissues. Um, following that there'll be a brief uh, video about the OSIRIS-REx mission, which was uh, NASA's mission to um, touch on one of the asteroids known as uh, Bennu and take a sample. Uh, many of you may have seen it in the media last month when it um, did a touch and go landing on uh, the surface of uh, Bennu on the 21st of uh, October, and certainly our time, it's 21st of October. Following that, um, there'll be a, a, a shorter talk um, on uh, astrogeology, meteorites and uh, spacecraft missions, again given by a, um, a uh, quite well-known geologist uh, in the area from the US, uh, Tim McCoy. Then after that, we'll look at um, how the global positioning system, GPS, uh, actually works. This is uh, not uh, very in-depth, but uh, given by uh, Professor uh, Neil Johnson um, from uh, the UK at the time, but uh, he's now in the USA. After that, uh, something uh, slightly different, going back uh, many uh, decades before the rise of uh, digital cameras, um, and uh, when people didn't have the technology to actually record uh, what they were seeing at the eyepiece, they would actually um, just use a pencil and uh, attempt to uh, sketch it on a bit of paper. And this um, interesting uh, talk goes through some of the techniques used and shows you how you can do it. So even if you don't have the technology, um, you can give it a go just with a pencil and uh, paper in your own backyard um, or wherever you might have uh, access to uh, a telescope. If, uh, if indeed you're using a telescope, you could also use uh, binoculars and some of the wider um, extended objects in the sky. Following uh, that talk by um, uh, amateur astronomer Jeremy Perez in uh, Arizona, uh, we'll answer the question, can you actually outrun a Tyrannosaurus Rex, uh, given by paleontologist uh, David uh, Hone from uh, the UK. And uh, there's a lot of urban myths around uh, about uh, whether or not uh, dinosaurs uh, have um, uh, fast speed and can actually maintain them for a long period of time and uh, this uh, from an expert in the field will put that to rest. Then finally we'll close by a uh, song by um, Hart. Uh, this particular one uh, is uh, care of uh, Paula Miles, one of our members. Um, there's no video of Paula this time but uh, we've put uh, the, uh, the tune submitted to um, footage of the Bennu landing mission and uh, showing indeed the, uh, the the contact on the surface and what uh, happened uh, thereafter. So the thing touched down successfully, took a sample of about at least 60 grams, it was probably a lot more of uh, samples from the surface um, by blowing com compressed gas uh, onto the surface to try and stir it up. Uh, unfortunately they took so much out that um, it uh, tended to clog things up so that when the, uh, the sampler uh, moved away from the asteroid. It had a little bit of trouble uh, closing the shutter because of all the debris uh, blocking the way, but uh, I think they've got past that now, and uh, that will be uh, on its way uh, back uh, back to Earth uh, in a, a couple of years now. So overall they were very happy with uh, being able to do it the first time uh, because uh, they had made uh, provision for going back a, a few times to uh, ha have another go if the first one didn't work and uh, for example maybe the surface was too solid where they decided to go and so not very much or, or if anything uh, was kicked up but uh, as it was they were very surprised and uh, lots were thrown up. So we'll uh, move on now. So recently the uh, society obviously has not had any public uh, scout or girl guide nights um, uh, intentionally. Uh, in fact, um, many of the nights such as schools wouldn't be possible even if we were doing them because a lot of uh, schools have, uh, if, if perhaps maybe even all, all schools, have stopped um, uh, any such uh, incursions or excursions this year. And indeed, um, we decided earlier on in the year to uh, give it a rest uh, because of the, uh, the risk of uh, cross-infection occurring um, by, uh, by visiting schools. Uh, now, with luck, that will begin again in 2021. Um, almost certainly the first ones will be public nights, uh, very probably in January, depending on how much uh, restrictions of ease, but we're quite confident that uh, something is going to happen there. 
Ordinarily in January every year we have at least three of uh, the Fridays in January and sometimes all of the Fridays in January as public viewing nights at the Briars and uh, probably next year is going to be uh, no different uh, other than the fact that we may be limited on the number of people that are possible and there may be uh, restrictions on what we actually do. So for example we may not be handing around a meteorite um, for people to look at um, so as to try and reduce the chances of um, infection uh, being uh, spread on surfaces. Now on the 7th of November, the Society had uh, its next uh, online Zoom meeting of uh, members. This was just more a, uh, a social get together and a chit chat and that uh, worked uh, quite, quite well for those members that uh, were able to drop in uh, some, some for just a few minutes and some for um, uh, a couple of hours. And uh, on the 11th of November, the committee had its uh, uh, committee meeting. And in this particular case, uh, the primary thing on the agenda was uh, trying to get together a COVID safe plan uh, based on what we know to be the uh, rules in place uh, at that time. And uh, that was then duly submitted to um, the Mornington Peninsula Shire and to uh, the, the Briars Management uh, for their uh, consideration as well. Um, also discussed at that meeting was uh, what to do with uh, the Christmas dinner, given the uh, restrictions in place. For example, at the time of making this uh, video, um, we are actually limited to a maximum of 10 people in the largest room that we have, which indeed is the auditorium, um, which in practice is far too small for um, running a, a regular general meeting, where, uh, where typically we'd have a lot more members uh, than that. Uh, particularly when you have the uh, the organisers and the uh, presenters there as well taking uh, part of that tally. And committee also discussed about the uh, um, the listing of the society as one of the um, uh, member benefits uh, programs of uh, Ritchie Supermarkets and indeed we, we've signed up to that so any member who wishes to um, have uh, a part of their proceeds of their shopping automatically uh, uh, be donated to the society um, please um, uh, go, go to Richie's with your Richie's card and uh, assign um, your designated community group uh, to uh, MPAS. We uh, are the only astronomical society in Australia in there uh, at, uh, at the moment. Then on the 18th of uh, November which is uh, ordinarily this night uh, held at the Briars for the monthly meeting. Instead of that, uh, it was uh, a small invited audience of um, uh, under 10, uh, listening to um, uh, myself and uh, Trevor Hand uh, explain our learning points over the years of how to put together a presentation and also how to deliver it to uh, the audience with uh, lots of uh, hints and tips. Now this particular audience are um, uh, prospective members who've put up their hand to um, uh, step in to give uh, say public nights or potentially school nights and scout and girl guide nights uh, in the future as well. And of course by having more uh, speakers that are, are trained and uh, become over time confident enough to um, deliver these talks it uh, provides some resilience should uh, one of the regular speakers uh, become ill or unavailable for some other reason as well. So um, that uh, that meeting on the 18th uh, um, has gone ahead uh, very well and um, they're uh, well on the way to being uh, another batch of us. Now coming up soon, um, in uh, a few days on uh, Sunday evening it should be uh, an announcement by the state government on the easing of uh, uh, further easing of uh, restrictions uh, of uh, the, uh, the, the pandemic uh, status and with luck that means that the group size is possible at the Briars will increase. Undoubtedly there'll be some uh, factors still in place such as um, mask wearing and uh, hand cleaning and social distancing and uh, registering your attendance uh, coming into the site and possibly even going out of the site if, uh, if you look at the New South Wales example where they record both. Um, and uh, on the 25th of November um, committee will have its uh, next meeting. At this stage it's probably by Zoom but it may indeed also be possible to have it in person at the Briars as well. Uh, just a, um, a reminder that any member is welcome to observe those meetings uh, if they so wish. They're not uh, talks about 
uh, astronomy in any way. It's more about the practical aspects of uh, running an astronomical society. But uh, you can get to see what goes on and get to, some, uh, get to see some of uh, the uh, people that otherwise you might not or might not get to see, uh, particularly in the absence of these face-to-face uh, -face get togethers at the Bryars. On the 5th of December at this stage, we've still scheduled the online social gathering and on Zoom, which is on the first uh, Saturday of the month, and um, committees get to decide if that uh, continues. Um, if face-to-face -face becomes possible again, then it may become um, uh, superfluous. Um, if there's any preference from members to keep it going regardless, maybe you can't get to the Briars, for example, uh, on Saturday because of uh, other commitments and you'd like to see it uh, continue on, uh, just let us know, just uh, send an email to uh, eScorpius so that you know, or alternatively um, post an email to the Society's email address of welcome at mpas.asn.au and uh, that way committee will uh, get to uh, see. Um, the good news is in uh, December, uh, committees decided to have a December meeting. Normally we don't have a December meeting in, um, uh, in the Briars. Uh, this year we're anticipating we'll have uh, at least some access to the Briars again for uh, a, a group of uh, a fair size. So on Wednesday night, the 16th of December, there'll be uh, an impasse meeting uh, held uh, in person at the Briars, or at least uh, unless something unexpected happens. Then a couple of days later, on the Saturday evening, 19th of December, it's the annual Christmas dinner at the Briars. This year uh, it uh, will be uh, a catered dinner again, and this um, this year is also, uh, the committee's decided to um, provide it uh, for, uh, for free to uh, members. Um, there is a holding fee being charged, and that will be refunded to anyone who actually does turn up on the night, because in the past... We have had some issues with members uh, saying they'll, they'll come along and sometimes often with many other people, uh, uh, but then actually not showing on the night. So we end up with uh, lots of spare food and uh, some of it going to waste, unfortunately. Um, in all probability, I would say it will be an outdoors dinner. Um, so we'll, we'll be uh, sitting outside, um, but uh, it remains to be seen what the weather conditions are like and what the, uh, the limitations are uh, that we have there. Um, the dinosaur dig uh, that we had uh, planned uh, for this month in uh, a couple of days time has obviously had to be uh, postponed because it was intended to be a group of about uh, 50 for that and uh, we're not able to do that uh, under the current restrictions. However, it's been confirmed that it's now been moved uh, to Sunday the 12th of, uh, sorry, Sunday the 21st of March next year and that will be down at uh, Point Leo Foreshore and um, our geologist guide will be uh, taking us uh, around at uh, low tide looking for fossil evidence and also looking at some of the uh, geology and, uh, and rocks of the area as well. Um, there will be a booking uh, sheet come out for that or online booking to uh, register uh, in due course closer to uh, that particular date. So tonight's talk is uh, given by uh, Harrison Schmidt, who um, got his uh, PhD in geology actually whilst uh, stationed in uh, Norway. And um, he was uh, trained as uh, an Apollo astronaut, which meant that he also had to be a qualified uh, Air Force pilot uh, as well, had to be trained in that. And this uh, this particular lecture is uh, courtesy of the Florida Institute for Human and uh, Machine Cognition, where Harrison Schmidt um, has, uh, has been associated with uh, for some time. And indeed, aside from being a scientist, he's had his uh, stint as a, uh, a senator, I believe, in uh, the US as well, and lots of other advisory bodies to do with uh, space and uh, space exploration in the future. Now, he's a very good uh, speaker and um, so uh, prepare to be uh, entertained by this astronaut and so far the uh, last person to stand on the moon. This lecture is being brought to you in part by the generous gifts of these sponsors.
Uh, today, uh, I want to first of all uh, talk about a little bit of history, uh, then uh, give you a very quick uh, uh, review on what the Apollo 17 mission was like. Some of you, I'm sure, were here when I uh, talked to that, about that before. And then talk a little bit about how, uh, uh, what are some of the essential elements, I believe, necessary if we're really serious about undertaking a return to the moon and uh, using that experience again uh, then to uh, go on to Mars and to have an indefinite presence in uh, deep space. Uh, and I, as I look around, I have a feeling most of you are quite familiar with the history of Apollo, but let's do a quick review. <laughs> the, uh, <laughs> and that was not considered, uh, intended to be pejorative at all. Uh, you know, a lot of people don't recognize that uh, Dwight D. Eisenhower laid the groundwork for Apollo, uh, put the foundations in place that made it uh, possible to undertake it, at least in the time frame uh, that, that uh, existed at the time. Uh, he not only, as Supreme Commander of uh, our forces in Europe, uh, sent uh, two captains to bring von Braun uh, out of Europe, along with a number of uh, rockets and his uh, person, and as many as his personnel as they could rescue, uh, and that had an awful lot to do with the ultimate development of the Saturn V. <clears throat> but he also, in 1960, uh, January of 1960 to be specific, uh, sent uh, T. Keith Glennon, the then administrator of NASA, a directive by letter to begin the development of the Super Booster, which became the Saturn V. And that clearly was the enabling technology that uh, made it possible and won the space race and made it possible for us to go to the moon. Uh, uh, so uh, uh, well be uh, over a year before Kennedy issued his challenge, uh, we were well on our way, at least with that, uh, that booster technology, to being prepared. We didn't know how to do it yet, but uh, still, uh, you know engineers, <clears throat> they're confident they can do anything if you just describe what it is you want to do. Now, it, it, the, so, the Russian, uh, then Soviet challenge was well recognized. Uh, landing on the moon was proposed by President Kennedy to counter their advances in human spaceflight. Uh, the, uh, it was it really, we have to remember the, the whole impetus was geopolitical. It was a major competition within the Cold War. And its success uh, uh, really had a great deal to do with a loss of confidence in the Soviet Union. Immigrants have, have verified that on many occasions. Uh, and that uh, contributed to the ultimate demise of the uh, Soviet Union. Now, John Glenn orbited the uh, Earth in February of 1962. I was privileged to serve with John in the Senate uh, while I was there. Uh, Apollo 8 orbited uh, the moon 50 years ago this December. Hard to believe. Uh, Frank Borman, uh, Jim Lovell, and Bill Anders uh, are in the process of celebrating that event. Uh, and uh, Neil Armstrong, though, uh, successfully landed on the moon July 20th, uh, 50 years uh, next year. And that effectively, in most history books, ended the moon race. Actually, the moon race ended, if, uh, as far as the Soviets were concerned, as I understand, again from immigrants, when we successfully launched the Saturn V the first time. Uh, they did not have a moon rocket, we did, and it was pretty clear uh, what was going to happen downstream. Uh, even though it may not have been clear to everybody else, it seemed to be clear to them. Now there were five additional Apollo missions uh, between November 1969 <coughs> and 1972. Uh, and uh, each one of uh, those was, had uh, longer and longer uh, a time on the moon. But the last three actually had uh, the, uh, what was called the Block II lunar module. And uh, we had the opportunity for three excursions, each one seven to seven and a half hours long. So uh, really things matured very, very rapidly, thanks primarily to the foresight of uh, George Lowe, who was the Apollo spacecraft program, man program manager at, uh, <coughs> excuse me, 
at the, the Johnson, at the Manned Spacecraft Center then, now the Johnson Spacecraft Center. The, uh, George also uh, was responsible for conceiving of and persuading NASA uh, uh, managers, senior managers, uh, to undertake the Apollo 8 mission. He, uh, somehow that tends to get lost, but it was his idea and it was his persuasion that made uh, that uh, event happen uh, 50 years ago. Apollo 13, as you uh, I'm sure recall, and, uh, and many of you, I uh, hope you all have seen the movie. It's a very fine movie, should have won an Academy Award, uh, but politics, I think, raised its ugly head. Uh, but it was damaged by an explosion in April of 1970, and the crew uh, survived that, and that's what they had to do was survive. But most of the work was done uh, by people in Mission Control Center, young people, and the average age of those young people was 25 years old, 26, 25. And they had already flown several missions out of mission control. So you, you, uh, uh, these kinds of efforts require young people. They really do. The courage, the imagination, the patriotism, the stamina that they have is absolutely essential. And that is obviously true in our own defense establishment. And uh, we, we deserve, we, they deserve all the credit and, and, and thanks that we can give them. The last three Apollo missions explored different areas of the moon, uh, developed uh, through uh, the, all six missions that landed on the moon. We uh, brought back 850 pounds of moon rocks and soil. Uh, and it is clearly the uh, gift that keeps on giving as analytical technology matures and, and, and advances. Uh, we can go back to the samples that we've already analyzed and find out new things about them. It's really quite remarkable. And from that, uh, on the science side, which was not intended to be a, a significant part of the Apollo program, but became that, again, due to uh, people like George Lowe, uh, there's been a great new understanding of the early history of the Earth, uh, because the moon has recorded that history, and it hasn't been erased. On Earth, it was obviously recorded, but it's been largely erased because of the uh, tremendous geological dynamics of the uh, of our planet. Now, just to put this all in perspective, I don't think anybody, I don't think there's anybody here that remembers this flight. <laughs> I may look like I did, but I didn't. Uh, but in December 1903, of course, we had the first uh, uh, flight of uh, the Wright brothers uh, aircraft. And it wasn't in, it was by May of 1961, John Kennedy had the confidence, based on the confidence that the NASA's engineers gave him, uh, to uh, challenge us to go to the moon. And in December of 1969, uh, that was done. And that uh, challenge was met. Now, uh, this quote from Werner von Braun, I think, is very important. Uh, and we have to remember it as we go into the future. I've learned to use the word impossible with the greatest caution. Uh, and uh, uh, for my those of you that know about uh, Robert Goddard and his experiments in my home state of New Mexico, just to give you an idea how even uh, uh, how much things change and how fast they change. Uh, his uh, a crawler, if you will, is on the left, and the crawler that took the Saturn V's out to the launch pad is on the right. Uh, this I just like this picture. Uh, 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 Mike Collins, Neil Armstrong, and Buzz Aldrin, the first, uh, uh, the Apollo 11 crew, here are looking very serious, uh, including uh, Ken Mattingly and myself and everybody else in Mission Control Center. And as near as I can tell, what we're concerned about is waiting for acquisition of signal by the, uh, from the Apollo 8 spacecraft as it came out of lunar orbit. Uh, that was the key element of that uh, mission is that they indeed, the, uh, the rocket engine and the uh, command and service module fired and fired on time and that they were headed back on a trajectory to return home. Uh, that was the Christmas uh, mission, if, as you may recall. And uh, that happened right on the second it was supposed to. Uh, and uh, the uh, viewing room uh, behind mission control, you can just see some of the windows back there, was absolutely packed, as you might imagine. 
Same thing happened, of course, with Apollo 10. It went into orbit around the moon. They had their own firing behind the moon. That viewing room was essentially empty. You know, we're, we're strange people, we Americans. <laughs> you know, same risks, everything was the same, except, hey, we've done that. And so we're going to wait for, we're going to do something else instead of watch that coming about. Well, the, uh, the Saturn uh, system is all illustrated here, including spacecraft up on the mark. This is the rollout of the Apollo 17 Saturn uh, from the Vehicle Assembly Building down at the Kennedy Space Center. And for size perspective, down in the lower right there, there is a, uh, uh, a large fire truck. At the time this building was built by the Corps of Engineers, uh, it was the largest enclosed space in the world. That had, uh, that's changed. The Mall of America, I think, exceeded it at first. <laughs> and then I believe that there's an aircraft assembly plant in South Carolina, the building uh, 787, that now is, it has that uh, distinction. But I haven't researched it, so I could, I stand, I'm happy to be corrected. Uh, our, our launch, uh, shown here, was at night. It was, I understand, quite spectacular. I happened to miss that one. Uh, the, uh, and if you look carefully, if you can see, uh, I don't know whether we want to turn off these lights up here or not, uh, but uh, it'll take a little bit of that light off the, there you go. You see there's some bright spots on the left of the uh, rocket. Those are large chunks of frost coming off the rocket. We had to sit on the launch pad for about two hours and 40 minutes uh, after our scheduled liftoff because of a computer uh, misunderstanding. Uh, computer thought a tank uh, in the rocket had not been pressurized, but somebody had pressurized it when the computer didn't. But the computer was looking at whether a signal had been sent rather than whether it had been acted upon. Just a little lesson of garbage in and garbage out. And, uh, and, but also, because of the nature of computers in those days, that problem was solved with a shunt. <laughs> They actually wired around this, <laughs> the uh, terminals in the computer, so it just told the computer, that shunt told the computer that the tank was pressurized, okay? So ignore it. So we got off after they had convinced management, of course, that they knew what they were doing. <laughs> that took most of that two hours and 40 minutes. Now, our spacecraft uh, included, of course, the Command and Service Module America and the Lunar Module Challenger in the lower right. Uh, they were all tucked away uh, up in the top of that rocket. It, 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 that rocket developed 7.5 million pounds of thrust, weighed 6.8 million pounds fully fueled, and, and even though it put uh, 44 metric tons on a trajectory to the moon, uh, you know, you don't have, uh, you don't get much out of all of that. And one of my uh, current, one of the current astronauts has a great presentation, Ken, and Ken, we probably ought to get him down here to give it, uh, about uh, that if the Earth was just slightly bigger, we couldn't use chemical propulsion to get off of it. And we would be confined to developing some kind of a nuclear propulsion system in order to do it. Uh, so uh, we're very fortunate that the Earth is just the right size. And there it is. This picture uh, was taken from about 34,000 miles away as part of my documentation of, of weather patterns that I was describing for three and a half days on the way to the moon. I grew up as a, a son of an amateur meteorologist, namely my father, who was actually a geologist. And uh, we uh, tried to uh, f forecast and, of course, predict weather patterns in southern New Mexico uh, throughout my childhood. And so when I knew I was going to have three and a half days going to the moon, I said, well, I ought to expand that, uh, that amateur meteorology bent and, uh, and see if I couldn't uh, observe and predict weather patterns in the southern hemisphere, which you see here, largely the southern hemisphere. In the upper right of this picture, there's a large uh, typhoon or hurricane going ashore on the subcontinent of India. The intertropical convergence zone, of course, is, is nicely shown around the equatorial regions. But the nice thing about the southern hemisphere is there are not very many continent, continental masses, and so you get uh, f these very systematic fronts moving out of Antarctica, uh, turning into uh, uh, 
circulation patterns that you see there and uh, uh, circulating around their, their home. Now, the, uh, where we were headed for Apollo 17 is, is this uh, edge of a basin called the Serenitatis Basin, about 740 kilometers in diameter. And, and relative to the Apollo 11 landing site, uh, it was about 600 uh, kilometers north and somewhat more to the east. Uh, and and uh, so uh, it was in a different part of the moon, one of the most complicated areas we could find, the idea being that, well, Schmidt, if you're such a great geologist, we'll send you to as complicated a place as we can find and see if you can answer some of the questions uh, that are bugging us uh, related to the uh, samples and the observations that had already been made. If you look very carefully, more or less in the center of the picture, uh, there is a uh, uh, spacecraft. That's the command and service module. Ron Evans, our command module pilot, is alone in that picture uh, when this picture was taken. And he is performing what was called landmark tracking, first uh, put together by Jim Lovell and myself for the Apollo 8 mission. Uh, and this was something that turned out to be very important for our pinpoint landings. Uh, on the move, more or less pinpoint landings uh, on each of future missions. Uh, it, uh, the idea was that if you track small craters on the surface of the moon, the position of which you know relative to the center mass of the moon based on earlier spa uh, spacecraft uh, tracking, then you could tie that back and give your, your lunar module a better uh, idea of where the uh, our better knowledge of where the uh, landing site was. And this was extremely important for us because uh, landing in that narrow valley, that valley uh, that you see there is only about seven kilometers wide, uh, and we were going to land more or less right in the center of it. Uh, uh, and I'll show you where. If you, now in the lower right, there's a bright spot, white spot. That is our landing site. And you might ask yourself, why is it bright? It's, uh, now, this picture was taken just a couple years ago by the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter, which is in orbit around the moon today, taking extremely high resolution photographs from a wide variety of different angles. This happens to be what we call an oblique photograph. And uh, it, uh, uh, it has photographed not only our landing site, but uh, all the other, the other uh, five. And the reason that bright spot is there is because the descent engine effluents have winnowed away fine particles, which are somewhat darker than the coarse particles. And it gives you that high contrast that you see in this picture. Now, also, this picture shows the scar from, a, from an avalanche of dust that came off the side of the South Mass Sea there on the left. Uh, and uh, our, uh, our excursions took us over to the base of that, uh, that massif and uh, across the avalanche, and we gained a great deal of information, uh, not only about avalanches on the moon, but about the volatile materials that allow them to be fluidized, like snow avalanches are here on Earth. Uh, uh, one of the many things that came out of, that, uh, of our uh, three days on the moon. The Challenger, of course, is right where I indicated it was. Now, this is a picture that we had before we went to the moon. Uh, not nearly the resolution, the identifying resolution. This picture is uh, probably about 15 meters, whereas uh, you'll see in a moment, the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter gives us identifying resolutions less than, much less than a meter. Uh, the, uh, uh, this was, picture was taken by the Apollo 15 mission as it flew over the Valley of Taurus Littrow, which was to become our landing site. The, uh, and this is a Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter picture of our landing site. That's the, lunar, the Challenger descent stage uh, sitting there in the center of the picture. The, the uh, Lunar Rover is parked off to the right there. This was taken about, I think, four or five years ago. And, uh, and you even can see our, our tracks of our rover, if you look carefully. Now, the rover wheels are only about that wide, so you can see what the rev resolution of these pictures are. Uh, really quite remarkable. In the far left of the picture is the area where I deployed the, the Apollo uh, Lunar Surface <laughs> Science Package and, uh, uh, and actually laid out, uh, the, the, if you look very carefully, you'll see a, a 
parcel cross there, and that's a geophone line uh, for some active seismic work that uh, we also did. First view I had, however, going back in time so, uh, quite a bit, was this out of the lunar module's right-hand window, uh, looking towards the North Massif, the north wall of the valley. That, um, uh, the base of that massif is probably about three and a half um, uh, miles away uh, from, this, uh, from where this, uh, we landed. Now, I should apologize right now. You'll hear me use different units, and, uh, uh, and that's uh, fortunate we never got them confused in flight. But, but the, reason, the reason for different units coming up is that we built all of our spacecraft and rockets and everything using the English system of measure. Engineer, the engineers preferred that at the time. Uh, we flew them using a nautical system of measure, uh, navigated in nautical miles, and uh, we worked on the moon largely in the metric system of measure. And so every once in a while, I'll slip and, and, and go back and forth between them. The uh, bright object in the foreground there is one of 16 small rockets uh, with only 50 pounds thrust that we use to control the attitude of our spacecraft uh, in flight. And I just will draw your attention that to the, compare that 50 pound thrust with that rocket with the 1.5 million pounds of thrust in the F1 engine of the first stage, engines of the first stage of the uh, Saturn V, and you see the spectrum of technologic, of propulsion technology that was developed in order to uh, successfully uh, go to the moon. Uh, I, the third spacecraft we had really was this spacesuit. Uh, it had uh, all the aspects of a spacecraft. It had, uh, it, could, it could, you survive in it for about uh, eight to eight and a half hours. So it had plenty of oxygen and, and cooling water. Uh, it, uh, 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 of course, provide the pressure environment in which you could breathe. And uh, you had to provide the mobility, uh, which was fine. And it really, for that time, was an excellent uh, 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 spacesuit. Uh, I would hope that we improve on that significantly uh, in the future. Uh, we have not, probably not put the kind of resources into, into spacesuits that we should. And in particular, building suits of materials that either actively or passively can reject dust. Because when, you, when the future astronauts on the moon go into their habitat, uh, if you use this kind of, these kind of materials, you're going to bring a lot of dust in the habitat. And uh, uh, that's probably not a good idea. Uh, having inhaled lunar dust uh, four different times while I was there, uh, it, uh, it didn't seem to bother me, although other people say it, maybe it did. Uh, the, uh, uh, it, uh, it smells like gunpowder, by the way, and, uh, and it's just activated very fine dust, uh, and, and as soon as we took our helmets off, everybody had the same reaction. Yep, smells like gunpowder. Uh, the, uh, uh, and, and I think from, there are plenty of engineering solutions to keep dust out of the habitats, but one of the best is to not bring the suits in the habitat or have suits that reject dust. And I think we need to work on both of those solutions. Uh, this uh, uh, is the large boulder that we investigated that had, uh, we had seen, uh, one of the few boulders we could see on those pre-mission photographs. It had rolled down the side of, uh, of the north uh, wall of the valley, the North Massif, and it left a boulder track so we know where it came from. And that's one of the best ways for geologists to explore the mountains of the moon is to go where the boulders have left tracks and sample the boulders. Uh, it, uh, it's a lot easier than climbing up those mountains in that suit, believe me. This, it's hard to tell here, but the slope that I'm on here and the rover over there on the right is on is about a 20 degree slope. Uh, behind this uh, picture, uh, the... Uh, slope goes up to about 26 degrees. And, uh, and the boulder fell apart when it hit that change in slope. It broke up into five different pieces, two of which you can see in this picture. I'm just there for scale of this. Now, there's been a lot of talk about there's no color on the moon. I just want to show you that there is. You may have heard about the orange soil. 
Uh, and this is exa almost exactly what I saw when I discovered that orange soil and dug a trench in it. Uh, a colleague of mine, uh, Ron Wells, a retired astronomer from, uh, pardon the expression, Berkeley, uh, uh, is uh, he and his son are really uh, outstanding in, in processing images. And they just adjusted the color balance in these pictures. There's not any enhancement in that sense, but the, the colors are all there. You just have to change the balance. And uh, uh, NASA, when they originally printed these uh, pictures or developed these pictures, did not uh, actually try to get the color balance. But I had described what the color was, namely that it was the same color as a decal I had on the camera on my chest. And uh, uh, that was the control that was used in order to produce these pictures. And that's exactly what I was seeing. Sli somewhat red in the core and or orange to yellow on the sides. Uh, it just uh, really, uh, this, this is exactly right. So you can see that there, at least there is color. What is it? It's volcanic ash. And its color is because of the titanium iron ratio. It's a, it's a high titanium glass. And, uh, and it has, uh, it, that produces that color. There are green glasses that were sampled by Apollo 15 that didn't quite get the notoriety that this did because we didn't recognize that what they had done. And uh, that's why you want a geologist on the, every one of these missions. <laughs> uh, and uh, that green glass is a low titanium glass. So it, that's, that's what affects the color. And, that, and the, uh, that's been shown experimentally as well. Well, it's time to return, folks. And the, fortunately, the vice president and the president have uh, agreed with that. It is not entirely clear NASA has agreed with that yet, but uh, uh, hopefully they will as, uh, as time progresses here. Uh, if you're going to return, you're going to need just about what we had, uh, hopefully uh, with longer stay times and, uh, and, and more modern equipment. But we had a place to live, namely the lunar module. We had a transportation system, the lunar rover, and, and we had that spacecraft uh, from uh, work on the surface that I mentioned, the spacesuit. Uh, and of course, you need the support of the American taxpayers symbolized by the, by the flag. Now, uh, you can see uh, yours truly and others enjoying the president signing the, uh, the uh, directive that uh, hopefully has set us back on a course to the moon and on to Mars. Uh, there is a geopolitical imperative to doing that, just like there was for Apollo, maybe is equally as urgent if it's finally recognized. Uh, and uh, that uh, we need to uh, understand that imperative and educate uh, others on the uh, critical uh, nature of being dominant in space, that liberty and freedom uh, uh, have called us to, uh, to this task again. Uh, and ho ho science will benefit from this, but the primary driver, I think, is to ensure that uh, liberty is, uh, is protected in space as, as in the same way that we try to protect it here on Earth. And to do that, we're going to have to have focus. Uh, Apollo was an extraordinarily focused program, as you may recall. Uh, the, the management environment as well as the technical innovation environment was just unbelievable. Uh, it was a young person's program for the most part, and, uh, and it, it had adequate funding in order to make these things happen. Uh, that has to happen again, and management of NASA, or how, whoever is responsible for this, whomever is responsible for this, uh, must, uh, must focus on it uh, with a single-mindedness that uh, Apollo had. Uh, the, uh, uh, I want to mention this uh, question of adequate reserves. So those of you who have been involved in major programs of, of any kind know how important it is to have the reserves necessary to deal with those unknown unknowns, the unkunks, that invariably come along in complex programs. Uh, the, uh, the near demise of the space shuttle and the cancellation of Constellation were all related uh, to this. Apollo's reserves were around 100%. And the reason for that was that uh, the administrator, uh, Kennedy's administrator of NASA, James Webb, uh, asked his engineers, I'm sorry about that, uh, that automated uh, change there, uh, asked them what, he thought, what they thought the Apollo meeting Kennedy's challenge would cost. And they came in around, in those year dollars, around $8 billion. Well, Webb, when he went to Congress, 
and to the Office of Management and Budget, uh, said 16 billion in those year dollars. And that was, gave us about 100% reserve, and we used it all. How did we use it? We used it to deal with those unknown unknowns that came up. We had parallel design efforts for critical systems uh, so that if one didn't work out, we could move over to the other one, and that was done on several different occasions. And uh, today, I think we could probably take that down if, uh, if, uh, to about 30% uh, because we're smarter. We're a lot smarter than we were. And, uh, and, it, and but I think it's absolutely necessary to have that reserve. If, if you don't have it, you're not gonna make your milestones and you're gonna gradually lose political support. And uh, so uh, you'll, see, you'll hear me talking about adequate reserves uh, on many different occasions. Uh, the funding also generally has to be stable. Uh, and that was only gonna come if we as a nation make an a commitment to uh, the indefinite uh, occupation, if you will, the indefinite exploration of deep space, uh, ultimately to the occupation of the moon, I think. And that uh, uh, requires that we be competitive in space. Our uh, <clears throat> competitors here on Earth are working very, very hard to displace us in space, and we have to work even harder in order to maintain uh, the edge. <clears throat> And if you want to have a constitutional justification for all of this, it really is national security. Uh, space is a major part of that, both uh, technically and psychologically, uh, and uh, as, as was demonstrated in spades by Apollo. And we have to stay young. Uh, I'm not showing this to show how young I was at one time, but it, that's extremely important. Average agent during Apollo of the, both the contractor personnel and NASA personnel was in the 20s. Uh, average age of middle managers were in the 30s. And uh, we, in order to do that now, we're going to have to adopt the best of military and civil service rules uh, so that NASA can stay young. They, right now, they can't stay young. They're about twice the age of what NASA was uh, in Apollo. And uh, 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 it just has to work. It, it, the military. Uh, is able to stay young, they have to stay young. One of the best examples of that, of course, is the nuclear Navy, and they have a system by which they enforce uh, young, younging across the, uh, uh, the Navy. Um, and technical currency and flexibility is gonna be extremely important. Uh, we don't wanna reach so far that unnecessary technical risk is assumed. However, design for continuous production and upgrades in technically fluid fields, and actually most fields are technically fluid nowadays, uh, is extremely important. Uh, physics changes slowly. It does change, as you may be aware, but engineering can change overnight. And I just uh, draw your attention to the changes we've seen in, in, just, uh, uh, in, in just a few years in, in computation, in the use of composite materials. 3D printing is now just, uh, uh, exploding, and there's a, a something, there are materials, and I'll use one example, and that's something called graphene. The physicists don't really understand graphene, but it has unbelievable properties uh, for uh, doing things with very lightweight materials. Graphene is just a single layer of carbon atoms uh, that uh, is, uh, I think, going to revolutionize all sorts of areas in, uh, in engineering, and many of which we don't know about yet. Uh, we need to maintain internal agency and incorporate engineering design strength. Uh, you, it's one thing to contract, it's another thing to be able to manage and oversee those contracts and to have a diversity of opinion when you hit a problem uh, on what the problem is and how to solve it. Uh, the, uh, also, we need to have an, an open management environment, uh, minimal, minimize layers of decision making. Uh, during Apollo, a good idea could, uh, to solve a problem or to enhance a capability uh, could become, come up with in, in one day, be matured overnight, and, and reach it to a management decision the next day, literally. Uh, and and the, the best uh, uh, illustration of that is just how quickly good ideas could rise uh, from any level within the, the organization, because there weren't many levels. The, uh, 
and uh, but and for a while we avoided decision creep. Uh, I, I I began to when I went to NASA headquarters for a couple of years to manage their energy programs. I discovered that decision creep had already raised its ugly head in NASA. To get a letter out of my uh, office signed by the administrator to some other agency head or something, I had to get 14 signatures. It's worse. It's far worse now. And, and people just are passing the buck upwards until all decisions are being made at the top. You got to get rid of that. Got to have to get rid of that. Uh, risk management uh, has to be embedded at all levels of implementation. Uh, you've got to identify the major risks uh, and manage their mitigation, uh, prepare in advance for the responses, uh, and uh, design and train intensively, as like the uh, uh, military uh, pilots have always said, uh, design and train as close to possible to how you would fly. Uh, that, uh, all of that was something we did in Apollo and has to come back into a, a, a program uh, for returning to the moon. I'm very committed to this concept of managing the critical paths to success. They need to be under United States control in order to make the milestones necessary to uh, success and to guarantee stable funding. Uh, strong leadership will open opportunities for international partners to utilize, but international partners and commercial partners other than contractors being managed by and NASA should not be in the critical path to success. If you're really serious about going back to the moon and on to Mars, you're going to have to manage it in that way, in my opinion. Uh, skill requirements must drive diversity. Uh, I, always, I feel that the stakes are too high in space uh, to let political correctness drive diversity. There, you'll have plenty of, uh, of diversity within the uh, team if you uh, are looking for skills. The, uh, one of the things that has to be done, and we've really lost control of, and that is to develop the farm team, and that's STEM education. I know that's a very active area of activity in Pensacola. It's, it must be uh, uh, nationwide. Uh, and, and, by, and STEM, I think, includes a whole bunch of other things. It includes critical thinking. It includes history, uh, just a number of other things. But we have to get gain control of our education system again. We really do. That's the farm team. And uh, uh, I, I'm, I'll leave it up to you to figure out how to do that. Uh, I have plenty of ideas on how it might be done. Uh, private investment has long been a part of aerospace. Uh, entrepreneurial activity in the aircraft industry. Uh, some of you are old enough to remember that uh, uh, North American and uh, other uh, uh, companies, Lockheed, the old Lockheed used to design and build airplanes and then sell them to the military. And now they wait for the military to ask for an airplane. Uh, uh, entrepreneurial activity was always part of it and should be, and, and now is growing again, uh, thanks to the funding of some people who have funds that they, uh, they want to use in this endeavor. Satellite communications are often forgotten as the primary, as one of the major private sector activities in space. It is um, entirely private. Uh, clearly, the government sometimes is a customer, but is almost entirely uh, private. So uh, private space has been very active. Uh, contractor teams implemented, implemented most of Apollo. Uh, uh, very little uh, government supplied equipment, GFE. Uh, furnished equipment, and, uh, but uh, uh, most of it was by contractors. Uh, it requires very strong oversight. Now, uh, there's a, a new era, as I've indicated, of entrepreneurial investment. Uh, and they are, in fact, applying many of the lessons of Apollo. Uh, uh, in particular, they, tend to, they have attracted and are trying to maintain young people in their core operations. Uh, lunar research, and they have the management reserves, <laughs> at least uh, some of them do, uh, that can, uh, can deal with those unknown unknowns that we talked about. Uh, lunar resources that are going to be necessary to go on to Mars and also to support 
permanent settlements on the moon <clears throat> and other activities in space, and maybe even uh, energy production here on Earth in the long term through that helium-3 fusion that Ken mentioned, uh, that is probably best done uh, by private uh, entities. Uh, the government's not very good at doing that kind of thing, and, uh, and history has, told, has shown us. And so I, uh, I would suggest that we work out how that is going to be, be done uh, by the private sector. Uh, what's my conclusion for all of this? Well, first of all, it's no luck. It's no accident, our luck, that Apollo was successful. Uh, the management team, that, the environment that developed, particularly immediately after the fire that, uh, uh, in which we lost Gus Grissom and his crew, uh, was a very, very successful management uh, system. It enabled a Saturn-class mission every two months between November of 1968 and November of 1969. Unbelievable that we did that. And now we're looking at maybe having an SLS launch every two years. So something's got to change if we expect to be competitive in deep space. We don't want to uh, reinvent the past, but we certainly can learn from it. Uh, the physics of spaceflight won't change. Uh, but uh, if the concepts we used in the past worked, let's modernize them and use them again. And with that, I'd be happy to take any questions that you might have. All right, we're going to throw microphones at you, so be ready. Right here, first hand. Just hold it down. <clears throat> okay. Thank you for taking my question. Uh, as I understand it, there's an experiment still going on left by LLRs on the moon, which is lunar laser reflectors, where they uh, fire a laser at the reflector and they've recorded that the moon is moving away from the earth at about 1.5 inches per year. If this is true and we can reverse that calculation in 1.5 billion years, the moon would be touching the Earth. <laughs> so that brings the question of the age of the Earth and the moon. Do you have any response to that? Well, that, uh, that motion, yes, uh, that motion uh, away from the Earth probably started very early in, ex in an accelerated way, and then because of tidal forces. The tidal forces were much stronger early on than they were later. So. It, it, uh, it may have even, uh, that calculation may even be, be uh, uh, smaller than it should have been. Uh, I have not heard an explanation uh, for that. Now, my own uh, feeling is that the moon did not form as a result of a giant impact, which is the prevailing opinion of most of my colleagues. Uh, I think it accreted independently and was captured. And that would be more consistent with what you just described. It, it, the capture was maybe a billion years ago rather than uh, having formed at this, uh, as a result of this giant impact. There are a lot of reasons to, uh, I think, to doubt the giant impact, not the least of which are, is the evidence from that uh, orange ash that you saw in that picture which is, uh, has a, a, a high concentration of volatile elements in it that we don't see near the surface of the moon. So there are reservoirs of these volatile elements deep within the moon, and that so far is incompatible with the kind of uh, uh, modeling that's been done in order to uh, support the giant impact hypothesis. So I think what you, the question you ask, uh, which is why if you calculate backwards, uh, uh, the uh, the Earth would be much closer to the uh, uh, the Moon would be much closer to the Earth uh, may relate to that uh, again to that deeper and bigger controversy over the origin of the Moon itself. Now the the Moon and the Earth have essentially identical isotopic compositions. Uh, so however it happened, 
there had to be a mixing of some kind. That mixing may have occurred in the what we call the feeding zone around the sun, where both planets uh, evolved. The, and in that feeding zone, you would expect to have identical isotopic compositions. They would vary uh, radially from the sun, but within a given feeding zone, they would be essentially identical. But to six decimal places, for example, the oxygen isotopes are identical, the ratios of isotopes. And uh, that's another reason why I don't think the moon occurred by a giant impact. But that's an excellent question. Right here, and then there's some back over. OK. Will the Americans and the Russians and the Chinese get to Mars first, or will private interest? I think that uh, the, the <clears throat> certain entrepreneurs that think that, they're, that Mars can be done in a couple of years. Uh, <laughs> may be smoking something that they shouldn't. <laughs> Mars is going to be very tough. Not only getting there, uh, you have to deal with the radiation environment. Uh, now, the solar radiation environment can probably de be dealt with with a sh uh, shell of water. Now, you have to have the water. It's massive, and, and the moon is probably the best way to get it, best place to get it. But uh, the proton and electron radiation uh, from the sun and x-ray radiation, you can probably deal with with a fairly thin shell, a few inches of water. Galactic cosmic rays or something else. And uh, in fact, we had an experiment on Apollo 17 where we actually watched galactic cosmic rays create brimstone and radiation in our vitreous humor of our eyes. And uh, it's something the, the other, the earlier astronauts had noticed and commented on, and we actually did an experiment uh, where we uh, obviously put up shades, turned out all the lights, put on uh, uh, a mass, and uh, let our eyes do dark adapt. And going out towards the moon, you could see these fireworks in your in your eyes, and they're really quite spectacular. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and uh, the interesting thing is, for those of you who might be interested in that subject, coming back, we did an identical experiment, saw nothing. And at the time, and we were talking about a little bit this today, uh, at the time, this, the idea that I heard was that, that these rays should be coming from all directions. Isotropic is the word we use. And clearly, they were not isotropic for us. Uh, we, we didn't see them coming back. So they, they're coming from a direct, you know, they have a directionality to them that I have not heard, and I haven't pursued it, and I should but I haven't pursued it to try to find out what the current thinking is about that. But uh, the, uh, uh, it is, uh, Mars is going to be tough. Not only tough getting there and dealing with the physiological issues of getting there, I think we can deal with those. I think exercise and some other uh, techniques, uh, some of which are being worked on here at IHMC, uh, will, uh, will enable us to deal with the physiological side of long-duration spaceflight. Uh, galactic cosmic rays, I don't know how we deal with those yet, unless we can develop kind of energy sources in our, for our spacecraft, like fusion energy sources. They can give you enough of a magnetic field around the spacecraft to, uh, to divert those cosmic rays. But they're extremely high energy. They're, they're iron, they're, ad, they're atoms, uh, atomic weight of iron are, are more. The, uh, and they're coming very fast. The, uh, but the landing on Mars, we don't have to do that yet. Uh, there are quite a number of constraints. One is there's just enough atmosphere to bother you and not enough to help you. Uh, it doesn't take very long from the time you start to enter the Martian atmosphere until you're on the surface. It's like in the order of a minute, or depending on how you design the trajectory. Uh, the, uh, we, we spent uh, the better part of... Uh, of 10 minutes landing on the moon. So we had a lot of, a lot of time uh, to uh, deal with that. More, maybe more importantly, you're not going to have any help. The crews are on their own. And, uh, and everything has to be designed either to be automated or the crews have to have all the information they need in order to land, because mission control isn't going to be there to help you. you. The communication delay varies from eight minutes to 40 minutes, if I remember correctly. Uh, and uh, so 
the Earth is going to be a great data processing and planning uh, planet in the sky, but it's not going to help you much in what we call real time. In fact, it won't help you at all. Uh, so we need to learn how to do those things, and the moon's the best place to learn to do those. There's some just because you go there and you work in deep space, and you're only three days away from Earth rather than nine months, uh, or, uh, or you simulate things in order to learn how to uh, operate in space. You've got to remember, we don't have a, there's not a generation on Earth that has dealt with the risk of deep space. I mean, that, that generation's barely here anymore. Uh, and, uh, and so we have to train multiple generations over time uh, in, in a, in to think about how do you mitigate, how do you manage those risks of deep space. And they're unique. They're not the same as working in Earth orbit. Earth orbit has now become a pretty much an accessible, not a uh, part of our, of our uh, human activities. Uh, not without its own risk, but nevertheless, uh, it's much more accessible than it was at the time of Apollo. Uh, deep space hasn't changed. <laughs> it's, still, it's still going to be tough, and Mars will be one of the toughest things we ever do, uh, for some of the reasons that I've given. Another uh, question? This lady here. Were you able to discern the age of that avalanche? Yeah, as a matter of fact, we were. Uh, I'm, uh, it's somewhere between 75 and 100 million years. <laughs> and actually, it's on top of an older avalanche. It's probably about twice as old. We didn't know that. Uh, when I go back and look at the old pictures, I say, yeah, right. We should have known that. But it wasn't until we got these fantastic uh, variety of images from Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter that we could see that there's an older avalanche deposit underneath the, the, the younger one. So there were two of them. Uh, and, uh, that, uh, and they may have been activated by a, uh, a, what we, a, a fault, a th what we call a thrust fault, where, uh, where uh, rocks will be pushed over that way. The moon is, is contracting now. It's cooling enough that it's contracting. And every once in a while, it'll give you these thrust faults. And we're starting to understand that much more now than as a result of uh, of LRO images than we did before. But we, we actually studied one of those in the valley, where it goes right across the valley, uh, one of those thrust faults. And, uh, and it may be that the, those, uh, the thrust faults are periodically active, and they are triggering those avalanches, at least the one that we studied. We have time for one more question. Do we have any? Young, really young person here that wants to. How about this? How about this young man here? All right, thank you, sir. Uh, you stated during your presentation that NASA's or NASA's uh, reaction after the Apollo One fire helped Apollo succeed. How does that differ to NASA's reaction after Columbia and Challenger that crippled and almost killed the space shuttle program? Well, uh, it for one thing, the uh, the Apollo effort had a very strong geopolitical impetus behind it. Very, there was bipartisan support for it in the, uh, politically. Uh, the shuttle has not had that. It did not have that. Uh, secondly, uh, the, uh, the reaction to the Apollo 1 fire was immediate. Uh, the NASA reorganized itself uh, at, the, at the top, uh, pretty much. and uh, And put together teams uh, that will became very active uh, right away to, uh, to deal with uh, both understanding the, why we had the fire and then what needed to be done about it. In fact, that process had begun before the fire. Uh, the management already knew that there were problems with that, the design of that spacecraft and with all of the, uh, of the waivers that had been given for flammable materials for the use of glycol in the cooling system and things like that, uh, all of which probably contributed to the, uh, to the deadly nature of that fire. Uh, that work was already underway in a Block II command and service module uh, design. And Frank Borman led uh, George Lowe's team that went out to, uh, that's what brought George Lowe into the management position that he had was the fire. Uh, Joe Shea was replaced. 
And uh, <coughs> the uh, 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 Borman was the uh, Lowe's man in California, and it just it was there was an energy behind the reaction to that uh, that you didn't see uh, in NASA management with respect to the shuttle accident, accidents. In fact. Uh, after the first one, NASA sat on their hands Did they, for about a week, and you ended up with a commission. Uh, to uh, and that was a mistake. Uh, and, and we always had in the, in the early days what was called the blue book, as I recall, on the shelf, which is what you do in case of a major accident, and you should pull that off and implement the plan that has been put together in a much more uh, benign environment than it then comes after an accident. Uh, and, uh, and unfortunately, the NASA administrator at that time did, did not implement it and did not get going fast enough. Uh, it, whether it would have made any difference or not, you can't run two experiments, but it still uh, should have been done in a much more vigorous way than it was. Hi all, Mark Stevens here with Sky for the Month for November 2020. As uh, we approach summer and our viewing time seems to get a little bit shorter or certainly later into the evening, we still have a couple of interesting uh, objects to look at. We still have uh, Jupiter and Saturn, although they are heading towards the western horizon. However, Mars having just passed opposition is still in a very good spot to have a look at. Uh, also noted is we now start to see the reappearance of the Orion constellation, bringing with it its uh, spectacular nebula. Without any further ado, let's move on. Highlights for the month uh, include uh, a new moon on the 15th to the 11th. Uh, it means we have nice dark skies to have a look at whatever we want to have a look at. Uh, Mars appears stationary, not that you'd really notice it, but uh, it has been moving in a retrograde motion for the last uh, few weeks, and it, it's just an apparent situation caused by our orbit relative to, to Mars's. Jupiter uh, and Saturn are both fairly close to the Moon, and are slowly moving closer to each other. Uh, Ceres, the largest of the asteroids, uh, is only less than a degree southeast of the Helix Nebula. And uh, on the 27th, we have the Moon at Apogee, which means it's as far away from uh, Earth as it gets, and the full Moon occurring on the 30th. Moving into December, uh, the particular one of note here is on the 17th, when you have Jupiter, Saturn, and the Moon in very close proximity to each other. Certainly one to look for. The nape of Imba sky looking uh, towards the south has several uh, quite interesting objects to, uh, to capture your imaginations. The large Magellanic Cloud, uh, just uh, above and to the left of the South Celestial Pole there, containing the uh, Tarantula Nebula. You will need a telescope to see it, uh, although in particularly black skies you can see the large Magellanic Cloud uh, quite easily. Over near the smaller Magellanic Cloud, you have 47 Tacanae, which is uh, probably the next best globular cluster in the sky to Omega Centauri. Certainly uh, very, very uh, good size. Uh, not much difference between it. Uh, as I said, uh, rising in the evening now, <coughs> we have uh, Orion, bringing with it uh, M42, the uh, Orion Nebula quite visible in even relatively small telescopes, and uh, hopefully it's bringing Betelgeuse with it. As for the November sky uh, looking to the north, uh, if you happen to have an extremely uh, good view towards the north there, you may very well be able to see the Andromeda galaxy uh, in the constellation of An uh, Andromeda. 
will be fairly low to the horizon, but uh, it should be visible, as I said, if you can get that uh, northern perspective. Uh, once again, we have uh, Canis Major coming up uh, alongside of Orion there, uh, bringing the brightest star in the sky with it, Sirius. So what are the planets doing this month? Well, Mercury uh, is still a, a morning object, having passed maximum elongation on the 11th. By maximum elongation, I mean it's the greatest angle off from the Sun, and so it, being its furthest from the Sun is normally the best, to, uh, best position to view it. Unfortunately, uh, it's just passed through the ecliptic plane, so being close to that, it tends to be very low on the horizon. So I wouldn't bother getting out of bed for that one. Venus, uh, still a morning object. It has uh, passed its maximum elongation as heading towards superior uh, conjunction. Uh, that essentially means uh, it will be on the other side of the Sun from Earth, so certainly not viewable in that position. Uh, it does move towards Antares, which is the brightest star in Scorpio, uh, around about the 24th. Uh, Earth moving into the southern hemisphere summer, uh, south pole will be tilted towards the uh, sun and so uh, hopefully days uh, will get a, a little bit warmer. As to the outer planets, uh, Mars is visible in the northern sky after evening twilight, quite distinctive uh, red appar apparent object uh, in the sky even by the naked eye. It uh, has completed its uh, retrograde motion. It does this uh, due to the relative positions of uh, Earth and Mars orbits, so it doesn't actually go backwards, it just appears to. Uh, it will resume normal motion against the sky background on the 16th to the 11th, and uh, having passed its opposition, it is getting smaller, but it's still very good for uh, visual astronomy. Uh, Jupiter, still visible in the early evening sky, uh, it is disappearing over the horizon uh, as daylight approaches or uh, recedes, and uh, over the course of November the distance between Jupiter and Saturn will decrease uh, by about 3 degrees, from 5 degrees to 2 degrees, and uh, something to look forward to next month will be a, a very close conjunction of Jupiter and Saturn. Uh, Saturn, uh, as I said, is being uh, at the moment very close to Jupiter. It will be the third component of an interesting little conjunction uh, with the three-day-old crescent moon. So uh, the moon will be a bit of a sliver, and uh, the base of the triangle will be Jupiter and, and uh, Saturn. Uh, it, uh, it also continues to move closer to Jupiter and will end the month about two degrees apart, or about four thumb widths held at uh, arm's length. Uranus uh, passed its opposition on the 1st of the 11th. Uh, it doesn't really matter being in opposition. It uh, still requires a telescope to see it. It doesn't have a lot of uh, detail, but you will be able to note its uh, blue-green colour. Uh, Neptune, a worse situation than Uranus. Uh, it's currently in Aquarius, just passed its opposition. You will require a telescope. Uh, of around 8 inches, and you may be able to see its largest moon, Triton, but you'll certainly uh, note what is quite a distinctive blue dot. And this is essentially how the planets will appear, uh, depending upon your telescope, uh, the size will change and vary. Uh, Mercury, having passed between uh, Earth, oh, it's minor conjunction, if you like, or inferior conjunction, has now moved out on the 11th of November to its greatest elongation, uh, is a morning object, and as it moves towards a superior conjunction, you will see more of its face. Very small, very close to the ecliptic plane of the Sun, so not an ideal time for looking at Mercury. Uh, Venus is moving uh, through its maximum elongation, being a little further from the Sun than Mercury, uh, and bigger than Mercury, it, it tends to be still a viewable object, but you will need to get up in the morning to see it. Mars, uh, 
as I said, past its opposition. It's quite large uh, relative at the moment to, to what it can normally be and uh, certainly a very good time to, uh, to be viewing Mars. Saturn and Jupiter are both still in the sky, uh, both still putting on a, a terrific display for, for people who uh, wish to see them. You've probably got another one or two months to actually catch them before they uh, dip below the horizon uh, and disappear from our night sky. Uh, Uranus, Neptune, both up there, you will need a telescope to see them. And as I said, not a lot of detail, but uh, what you really look for in these two is the, the different colours. As for the other stuff, on the uh, comet front, we, this month we only really have comet uh, 88P HAL uh, moving into Capricorn on the 22nd. Uh, it's already gone past perihelion, so it's uh, heading back into the outer solar system again. So uh, it is expected to fade from 9th magnitude to 10th magnitude. So you'll definitely need a telescope to have any hope of seeing it. Uh, it is, however, up during the evening, so uh, for those who wish to hunt it down, go for it. Uh, as for the others, uh, Comet El uh, Enki has uh, it's around about 14th or 15th magnitude now and generally uh, not really visible, and Pan Stars is uh, setting before uh, the end of daylight. On the other front, a couple of meteor showers. We have the Northern Torrids, uh, active from the 20th of October to the 10th of uh, December, peaking around November 12th. Uh, I'm aware that has already occurred. Uh, these meteor showers are known for slow moving, very colourful fireballs when they're uh, particularly active. So. Uh, and I believe best viewed sometime during the morning. The other one is the Leonids. Uh, they're going to be active from 6th to the 11th to uh, the 30th and uh, once again most active in the morning. Uh, but potentially uh, they're hoping a fairly good show uh, with this year. Potentially 10 to 20 meteors per hour. Only uh, <coughs> two minor planets are in opposition uh, this month. You've got uh, Flora in uh, Cetus and Nemosa in uh, Taurus. Uh, Cetus at uh, magnitude 8 may be uh, possible in a smaller telescope. 10.6 you'd probably need a bigger one for the other one. And uh, for Pluto, currently in Sagittarius, which it's, it's been for the last couple of months, it is setting around about 11pm, uh, but uh, given Sagittarius has the centre of the galaxy behind it, you probably uh, need to take a series of photographs over a period of time. Continuing my uh, solar system tour, Tonight uh, we have a brief look at uh, the ring planet Saturn, second only in size to Jupiter, and uh, a little bit more than twice as far away from the Sun as what Jupiter is. Certainly very spectacular to look at through uh, even modest sized telescopes. Uh, Saturn, who was named after the Roman god of uh, wealth and agriculture, not really sure where they got that one from. Largely consists of hydrogen and helium gas with a uh, small solid core and uh, despite its large volume it only has about an eighth of the density of Earth which essentially means if you could find a, a lake or a sea big enough it would float. Diameter is 120,536 kilometres and at last count it has 82 moons with uh, formal designation but uh, believed to have considerably more than that. Distance from Sun is a uh, rather huge uh, 1,425 million 983 kilometres, which to most people doesn't mean a lot. So we'll go with astronomical units. It's 9.5 times as far from the Sun as what Earth is. Has an orbital period of 29 years, so don't look forward to too many birthdays if you lived on Saturn. Uh, Saturn is the furthest planet from the Sun, 
that uh, we can actually see with the naked eye. Uh, given it's just over twice as far as Jupiter, uh, it gives you an idea of just how reflective uh, it and its rings are. When uh, looking at it through a telescope, uh, the things to look for are obviously its rings, uh, which as it moves around, you will see the, ru uh, the rings at different angles and uh, different perspectives. Uh, something to look for between the two brighter rings is a gap called Cassini's Division. A uh, reasonable size telescope needed and should be able to uh, spot it quite well. It uh, lacks the surface detail of, uh, say, Jupiter, uh, but it, it does have some. But uh, once again, you'd need a fairly sizable telescope to, to pick out anything significant. Has uh, one rather large uh, moon called Titan, and uh, generally, when looking at Saturn, you uh, can usually pick up Titan. And here it is in all its glory. Uh, from this photograph, you can quite clearly see that it does have bands similar to uh, Jupiter. At its uh, north pole, there, you'll note a, a darkened area which is hexagonal in shape. And astronomers are still baffled as to why it is that shape. Looking at the ring system, you can see it's a significant number of uh, rings, it's not any uh, one ring. And uh, the two brightest ones, the two white ones there, separated by that black division known as Cassini's division. That is uh, generally quite visible through uh, even a reasonable sized telescope. And that ends Sky for the month for November 2020. As usual, tonight's information was provided from Astronomy 2020 from Wallace Dawes and Northfield. I do believe the Society has a couple of the 2021 books uh, available to purchase. Hopefully in the next few weeks when we can start returning to the Briars site. And Saturn's image was courtesy of NASA. Thank you. Hi everyone, this is a special topic for our dinosaur geology outing. I ended my last talk with a little preview of that too. But it's pre-recorded so I don't know whether the excursion goes ahead very soon or not for a while yet. I see the topic as not dry as a bone but about watery organic tissues as well. Let's first pretend to be living on the moon, then taking an excursion to a blue, blue place, then plop into the blue, blue sea to look for giants, dead or alive. Just imagine strolling on the moon, moon dust, moon rocks everywhere, dirt common. Picking up a rock, what if it's found to be a meteorite from Earth, from that blue ball up there? So Earth rocks are rare on the Moon, but how rare? If not that rare, why not? And what about that model of a collision creating the Moon? Maybe the planned speaker, astronaut, geologist Harrison Schmidt has explained that. Should there be more meteorites? on the other not dark side of the moon? Why more? Or if not more, why not more? But now let's go to the third planet.
upon earth. Moon rocks are so rare. Other basic questions. What about meteorites from Mercury and Venus? Some Earth rocks on the surface are in their original form, 4 billion years old. Others have changed and are everywhere, dirt common. And you can watch active volcanoes and lava flowing towards you. You can stir it, watch it cool. Warm your feet while you have lunch. No, I was not raving lunatic. This was my real life experience in Hawaii. So terra firma, not so firma. Shifting, shaking, rolling, crumbling, tumbling, bubbling all the time. The Melbourne Museum, among other places, has fascinating collections with excellent information about geology, meteorites, dinosaurs, giant squids, and lots of other things. But to find a meteorite yourself, what's your chance? Here I have for you the proportions of stony and iron meteorites found so far. But the more people look for them, the more will be found. The good news, I think, is the majority of the stony also contain iron as scattered grains. So a metal detector or a magnet ought to be useful. Please do be careful though. Research on safety first before you buy any strong neodymium magnet. I'd say buy just a weak normal one. Now then, about 71% of the Earth's surface is water. So, what meteorites fall into the sea? What about dinosaurs search for on land? What dinosaurs of the oceans and what geology signatures lie on the ocean floor? It has been found that dinosaurs have been very well preserved at sea. What about some sunk lands? Avalon? Australia? Dinosaur bones are common in the UK, for example. I knew some back gardens where it was not unusual to find dinosaur bones. Why common there? Why not in Australia? I asked Mike Cleland, our guide for the outing. Please do ask him again. So while we cast eyes back to the past and outwards to outer space with fascination, no less so, and in fact much, much more so, I for one have eyes of astronomical fascination, 
treasuring those living right now, and the land and sea features right now. As to plants and other things, in a few years or decades or hundred years, when people become fascinated by this, I will be telling them, "I saw this with my own eyes. I heard them. I touched and hugged some of them. I do that now. I am fascinated by them now." Wishing that we all treasure them now. Well, I have taken us from taking a stroll on the moon, then to the blue earth, and into the blue blue sea. I have turned a few things a little upside down to explore some thoughts on the topic of rocks, bones, and tissues. To that, here's another challenge for you: design a most creative transport. Use waterways, tubes, or open with squid-like capsules. No friction. Jet away and slide. Acceleration, deceleration, and speed lanes. Tentacle parking. You won't have any collisions. You slide over each other in 3D. I hope we will all enjoy exploring on our dinosaur geology outing. Whenever that may be, not as any distraction, but just possibly, someone will stumble on some meteorites. Enjoy the excursion, everyone. Bye. As we started to approach Bennu from a distance, and it started to fill up the camera field of view, it looked exactly like we thought it would, with a few boulders sticking out. But as we got closer, we expected to see a very sandy surface with maybe a few boulders here and there. And what we saw is very little sand. And we saw these mountains, we saw boulders, we saw rocks, and we saw very few areas that had this sandy surface that we were expecting, and what we had designed to. We have never done this before. We're actually going to collect a sample and bring it back down to Earth for further examination by scientists. In order to achieve that objective, the OSIRIS-REx spacecraft has been navigating around Bennu for about the last two years, studying it in great detail, and also overcoming a number of challenges that Bennu has presented. We were looking for locations on Bennu that were 50 meters in diameter, relatively flat. And covered with fine grain material, and by fine grain material, I mean stuff that's the size of a dime or smaller. We realized that there were no sites on Bennu that even came close to meeting this criteria. Everywhere we looked was too small and covered with boulders. So we actually had to fly a number of additional close passes over the asteroid and rethink our entire plan for grabbing the sample. After the additional observations of Bennu, we had to downselect to four sites, and then go back and survey those sites even further to select the final primary sample site. My first impression of Nightingale is that's the last place I wanted to go, but as we started looking at other sites, we saw that one, this is probably one of the most sampleable sites, and two, we were overperforming in our navigation capability and our ability to contact. 
Natural feature tracking works a lot like the human mind in that we pick up landmarks along the way. As we descend, we look at features on the ground. We program the computer to recognize certain features. It takes a picture, says this feature is not where I expected it to be. It's a little bit off to the side, updates its position based on where it's pointed and where that feature shows up in the camera position. The tag event is our touch and go event, which is where we'll actually be retrieving the sample from Asteroid Bennu. We start with a series of maneuvers, one of them being the checkpoint burn, which is where we'll actually check our position and velocity in relation to the sample site. And then the match point burn, about 10 minutes later, will zero out our horizontal velocity relative to the surface. And then about 10 minutes after that, we make contact with the tag SAM, fire the gas bottle, and then back away. And we hope to get at least 60 grams of sample and then we'll be able to store that and bring it back down to Earth. But there are several things that could go wrong and we also have to be prepared that we won't be successful on our first try at Nightingale. We don't only get one shot at TAG, we actually have three nitrogen bottles on board the spacecraft so we can potentially do three TAG attempts if needed. We go through several what-if scenarios and this is how we actually prepare for a lot of our contingencies. So we've had to look all around the surface and identify the rocks and boulders that if the spacecraft were to tip over up to 25 degrees, it could come into contact and be damaged. We had to develop a hazard map, which we program into the computer and says, if you're getting too close to those hazards, we'll do a wave off, we'll back away from the asteroid, we'll come back and do this another day. Everything might work perfectly. We come down, we touch the surface just where we want to, we fire the gas bottle, but the area we contact is covered in large rocks. Those rocks would prevent any fine grain material from being stirred up and captured in the tag sam head. Another similar scenario is if the tag sam were to touch on the edge of a boulder and become tipped up. In that case, when the gas bottle fires, much of that gas escapes out the side, not churning up the material that we want to capture. The day of TAG is going to be really exciting, but the excitement for our team doesn't end there. We have to verify that we have a proper sample. First, we're going to image the TAG SAM head by sticking it in front of one of the cameras. Then we're going to do a maneuver called the sample mass measurement in which we stick out the arm and we spin the spacecraft in order for us to decide if we've collected enough mass to be able to stow the sample and return home or if we have to try again. This is the culmination uh, of a lot of work. It's probably one of the most exciting missions that I've worked on. It is really exciting to know that we're finally going to be able to touch the surface of the asteroid and collect the sample to return back to Earth. Meteorites are pieces of rock or metal that hurtle to Earth from outer space. How can scientists use these space rocks to better understand the origins of our solar system? Scientists are analyzing the structure and chemistry of meteorites, prompting the launch of spacecraft missions to learn more about the larger objects they come from. Join us now for a conversation with geologist Tim McCoy to see how meteorites spark our desire to probe the cosmos. Now, here's your host, Maggie Benson. Hi, welcome everyone. Thanks for joining us for another episode of Live from Curious, Smithsonian Science How. I'm Maggie Benson. We have a really awesome show today. With us now is geologist from the Smithsonian's National Museum of Natural History, Dr. Tim McCoy. Hi, great to be here today. Thanks we're, for having me. We're so happy to have you here. So Tim, you're a geologist, but specifically, you are a meteoriticist. Right. I study rocks that came from outer space, meteorites. So we're the modern day space explorers. So like the people who traveled across the oceans or across the continents hundreds of years ago, we explore the solar system today. And sometimes we do that in our labs with rocks that fell from space, and sometimes we go out into space and explore the solar system. Very cool. We're going to kick off our show today with a great student question. So let's take a look. OK, great. Hi, I'm Colby from the Winthrop School. How do you tell that a rock is a meteoroid, not something else? That's a great question, Colby. That's one we get about 100 times a year from people who send us samples they think are meteorites. So one of the best ways is to tell what the rocks around you are supposed to look like and find something that looks different. And when you're looking for something different, 
couple of things we look for. So this is a meteorite, and you can see it has this black outer crust. We call this the fusion crust. That's the part that melted when it came through the atmosphere of our planet. And it looks quite different from the inside. So the outside is this black fusion crust. The inside, you can see, looks very different. And you can see the reflection in there from all that. That's iron nickel metal. That's extremely uncommon in rocks on Earth, but very common in meteorites. So if you find something that the outside looks different than the inside, that has flakes of metal and has this fusion crust, you might well have found yourself a meteorite. Do they all look like that? No, they don't. They look like a variety of different kinds. Just to show you another example, we'll talk about this a little bit more. This is a meteorite called Cape York. This is an iron meteorite that fell in Greenland. And you can see it looks very different from the chondrite here in the front. Here we have almost all metal and just a couple of other things. So we have a little bit of troilite in here, but this is almost 100% metal. And again, metal is one of the keys when you go looking for a meteorite. Wow, that's crazy. It looks really heavy. It is. It's about three times as dense as a regular rock. So the big ones, you know, we do curls in the meteorite collection. You really get your <laughs> exercise working out on that, trying to move those around. So do meteorites ever strike people from space? I mean, that would really cause some damage. It would. You wouldn't want to be hit by a meteorite because these things, for example, this is a meteorite that fell not very far from us, about five miles away in Lorton, Virginia, just across the Potomac River. And you can see it fell in here, it broke into several pieces. So this is one piece. But I this see it's fusion crust. It is. This is the fusion crust. But this thing actually fell through a doctor's office about 5.45 in the evening. This is the ceiling tile it fell through. So here's the hole that it actually went through <laughs> at the time that it fell to the earth. Did it hit the patient? It did not. Everyone was out of the office at the, at the end of the day. But these things, even though they're slowed down by the atmosphere, this is still falling at, say, 300 miles an hour. So this would really hurt if you got hit by it. But I wouldn't worry too much because the truth is, 20 people in the U.S. last year were killed by cows, and no one was killed by meteorites. So I wouldn't spend a lot of time worrying you're going to be hit by a meteorite. So a couple of years ago, I remember seeing all these videos on the Internet about meteors falling to Earth um, in Russia. Was that right. a rare occurrence? Um, it was rare that it was recorded. I didn't know there were so many dashboard cameras. I think we have some video that's going to show this. So here we see the start of the fireball that's coming across. And it's going to get suddenly very, very bright. And that's where the big meteorite broke up into a lot of small pieces. This is one of those small pieces. So this is a piece of chelybinth. There were literally hundreds of stones that fell to Earth. You can see, again, that fusion crust where it melted. And this is the interior of the rock. But a lot of people rushed to windows to see the light that came in. And then they were hurt by the sonic boom. Because remember, light travels faster than sound. And so... That sonic boom broke out a lot of windows. Fortunately, no one was killed, but several people were injured by the flying glass from the windows. So that fireball that we saw flying through the air, I mean, that kind of looks like a shooting star. Is that the same thing as a meteorite falling to no, Earth? No, not exactly. So when you think of a shooting star, a lot of people think of meteor showers. So you're looking at something like the Geminids or the Perseids. Those are typically tiny little dust grains from the tail of a comet. The Earth passes through where that tail was, and you see these shooting stars. Those don't survive passage to the ground. But if something does manage to make it all the way to the ground and we can pick it up, which is a rare event, we call those meteorites. So meteors and meteorites are related, but they're really two different things. So meteor is really just the light that is generated from something passing through our right, atmosphere. Right, right. So where are these meteorites actually coming from? We know they're from outer space, but from where? Well, that's a really good question. You know, we have a lot of them, so we know it must be some place where there's a lot of stuff. Maybe we should ask the audience what they think. I think that's a great idea. Okay, let's take a poll. So, viewers, here's an opportunity to take a live poll with us. Tell us, a meteorite comes from a planet, moon, star, an asteroid, or an object outside of our solar system. You can respond using the poll window that appears to the right of your video screen. And remember that this is the same place that you can post questions for Dr. Tim McCoy and Devin Schrader today. So Tim, we're watching the results come in and we can see that the top pick right now at 55% is an asteroid. Well, you obviously have a very smart audience. So most meteorites do in fact come from asteroids. So these are the things that orbit the sun. They're 100 kilometers in size. They orbit the sun between Mars and Jupiter. 
and they formed the asteroid belt. And so I think we might have a, a graphic here of the asteroid belt. And in, and that's in our solar that's system. That's in our solar system, that's right. So hundreds of objects. So here you can see between Mars and Jupiter, we have the asteroid belt. And so these things are coming from there. But I'll tell you a little bit later, they come from other places as well. So some of the other answers are not as far off as you think. So for example, here we have uh, a piece of a rock. You can see it's got these little white bits in it here and here. Those are um, a northosite. Now, if you think, well, where do I see some white rock up in the sky at night? The moon. The moon. That, that's right. This is actually a piece of the moon. Right here. Right here in your hand. So this is an anorthositic regolith, Brecha. So these are the white bits from the man and the moon. So you actually are seeing a lunar meteorite there, just like the Apollo astronauts held moon rocks. I can hold a moon rock here because it fell to Earth. So how did a piece of the moon actually break off of the larger planet and come to our Earth in the first place? Yeah, that's a really great question. How do they get here? Well, they're knocked off when things run together. So another meteorite will strike the moon or strike an asteroid and knock pieces off. And those pieces will then go into orbit around the sun, sometimes for millions or tens of millions of years until eventually they get to near the Earth and the gravity well of the Earth captures them and brings them to Earth. And they fall evenly over the entire surface of the Earth. So these are really impacts. Are there any evidence of these impacts on planets that are out there now? Yeah, we see a lot of times. We see craters on a lot of the uh, planets, including here on Earth. So if you've ever seen Meteor Crater. And in some of the rocks, like Chelyabinsk, you can see these little black veins that run through the rock. And those are actually impact melt. So a place where the shock wave melted part of the rock. So we see both direct evidence from the rocks and from when we look at planets. So is this evidence right here of impact? That's right. Those are all impacts. So Tycho Crater, you can see Tycho is really spectacular. It's got these long rays. And you can imagine at the end of one of those rays, some of that material didn't quite make it back and you end up with a lunar meteorite in your collection. So you mentioned the asteroid belt earlier. Are all these meteorites that are coming from asteroids, not necessarily the moon, coming from this location? Yeah, they're coming from the asteroid belt, but there are different kinds of asteroids there. So, for example, this one I've been showing you pr fairly frequently. Here we can see where all the asteroids are today. This is actually taken from this morning, and so this is the location. The big green belt is the asteroid belt. The blue blobs are the Trojans that lead and follow Jupiter. And all those red things are what we call near-Earth asteroids, things that can actually come closer to the Earth. And one of those green blobs in the middle, I don't know which one, actually has a name. It's 4259 McCoy. So that was I named after right me by, yeah, by a former post. I bet you don't have an asteroid named after you. <laughs> so is that you? Are you out in outer well, space right now? no, not exactly. But I can watch my <laughs> asteroid orbit around the sun. And so this is one of my favorite fun things to do. And you can actually study different kinds of asteroids. These are different sizes. Many of them are asteroids that I worked on. So 4 Vesta was visited by the Dawn mission. I worked on that. 433 Eros was visited by the NEAR mission, and so that was the first spacecraft mission I worked on. So all of these are asteroids that have been visited by spacecraft. But as I said, there are different kinds of, of meteorites that come from different kinds of asteroids. So here we have a chondrite, and if you look, there's this little round bit right there, okay? Mm -hmm. I can tell you that round bit just looks like a circle here, but it's actually a little sphere. Those are called chondrules, and I have a jar of them here. This is from a meteorite called Birbal. Let's see if I can roll that around. They you look see like those. little pebbles. They do. They look like little balls that roll around in there. And I can pick a few up. And I got a couple here laying on the table. Put them in my hand. And you can see they're just little round. Let's see if I can get that so the camera can see them without them rolling off. Little round there spheres. There, they're, they're kind of rolling around. These were free floating molten droplets in the solar nebula, the cloud of gas and dust our solar system formed from. So, you know, before there were asteroids or comets or planets or, or even the sun, there were these little chondrules. And so you're looking at the earliest stuff from our solar system. Wow, that's incredible. Okay? And we'll come back and talk a little bit about chondrules in a little bit. But some of these asteroids, you can see if we go back to the chondrite, if I get the light just right, you can see there are little bits of shiny stuff in there. Let's see if I can get this so you can see it. Yes, yeah, see ah, the shiny stuff in there? There's the shiny stuff. That's iron nickel metal. We talked about metal being something that's common in meteorites. Well, imagine if I heated that, melted it, and made a layered world like our Earth is layered. It has a core, a mantle, and a crust. 
But the core, for example, we've never seen the core of the Earth. It's about 3,000 kilometers below the, the surface of our feet, and yet we think we know what it's made of, and that's because of meteorites. So this is a meteorite. This one we looked at before. This is, again, Cape York from Greenland. Almost all metal. There's a few other little things in here. These little brassy bits are called troilite. This is iron sulfide. And just like if you've ever had oil spilled on your driveway and it rains, you get little blobs of oil in the water. That's mm -hmm. immiscibility. So here we have immiscible troilite and metal. That and didn't then, mix in. That didn't mix in. And then the metal, as it cooled, formed these long bars. And to make that pattern, you have to cool this at a few degrees every million years. So that's how we know these are the cores of asteroids. And they're very dense. They're very heavy. So it makes sense that it's the core of an asteroid. So this is probably as close as we get to holding the core of our own planet. So we know that this is from the core of an asteroid. That's right. And it might be similar to what is here on Earth. That's right. And if we want to move up just a layer, you can see where the core... Oh, we actually have pieces of these. So this is a, a very cool asteroid. So this is, we call it the dog bone. Its name is Cleopatra. <laughs> so if Sirius is the dog star, I guess this is its bone. And you wouldn't think it, but that's actually metallic asteroids. So that's the core of uh, an asteroid just floating out in space. All the silicate has been stripped off, and you can actually go visit these sorts of things. But if we want to study the surface of that core, we probably get to a meteorite like this. This is a palisite. If any of you were born in August, anyone out there born in August? Probably. Your birthstone is peridot. That's the gem name for the mineral olivine. So here we have green olivine set in metal. If I tip this up just a little bit, you can probably see the metal in there. Oh, you there. can see the metal yeah. and the crystals. And the crystals, and the crystals of olivine. It's so beautiful. just like a raft sinks down in water, that mantle of olivine, that thick layer of olivine, sinks down into the core, and you get these palisites, probably our prettiest meteorites. So these meteorites are actually giving you an opportunity to study core material and mantle material right? Um, without actually having to uh, explore the Earth. Right, because the deepest hole we've ever drilled on Earth is only about 16 kilometers deep. You can Remember, never get deep enough. No, no, you can never drill to 3,000 kilometers. And so how are you going to do that? You're going to study meteorites. But you notice there's a layer we haven't talked about on the Earth, which is the crust. Now, some of you have seen the crust. Most of you have walked on the crust. I hope you've all walked on the crust. But um, if you've ever been to a place like New Mexico or to Hawaii, you've seen lava rocks. We call them basalts as geologists. And basalts form from volcanoes. You've probably had people on your show talking about volcanoes in the past. We have. Well, imagine that we're volcanoes on asteroids, OK? So this is actually a basalt from an asteroid, except instead of being new, like the rocks from Hawaii, this is four and a half billion years old. Wow. So we went all the way from this jar of chondrules to this basalt on the surface of an asteroid in something like 50 million years. I mean, really quick processes. And you can actually hold these in your hand. You can actually see the crust of an asteroid. So. Tim, we have a student question. You want to take oh, yeah, it? Yeah, sure. All right. This question comes from Molly, John, Michael, and Emily. How many meteorites do you find each year? Oh, that's a good question, Molly, John, Michael, and Emily. So <laughs> one of the best places to go look for meteorites is actually in Antarctica. And the Smithsonian, along with NASA and the National Science Foundation, send people to Antarctica each year to collect meteorites. And we collect between six and 800 meteorites a year. So we've collected more meteorites in Antarctica over the last 35 years than have been collected over the entire surface of the Earth in the previous 500. But ones that fall to Earth, like Lorton, probably you know a hundred or a couple hundred a year fall to Earth. Most of them fall into the oceans, but maybe 10 or 12 of this type, freshly fallen meteorites, are actually collected from the surface of the Earth each year. So we have another question. This okay. one comes from Susan, who's watching with our friends over at the National Air and Space oh, Museum. Hey. Susan wonders, could meteorites ever originate from Earth? That's a really great question, Susan. And it's one of those things that we actually think, remember, meteorites are really old, like four and a half billion years old. We'll come back and talk about that. The oldest rock on Earth is only about four billion years old. So there's a half a billion years of the solar system's history that we don't have recorded in rocks from Earth. but but we think that meteorites from Earth could have wound up on the moon. And if we sorted through enough lunar soil, we might find some of those earliest Earth rocks. Wow. So probably not things that go up now that come back to Earth, but we could look for Earth meteorites on the moon. Wow, that's really cool. So we have another question, but this one comes in by video. OK, let's take a look. Hi, I'm Izzy from the Winthrop School. 
And I want to know how often is it that meteorites come to Earth? Hey, Izzy, a great question. And again, probably a few hundred times a year, but remember the Earth is covered three quarters by water. So most of them fall to the bottom of the ocean. It's probably not a good idea to go looking for them there. But, you know, most of the ones that we see fall, it actually when someone sees them fall, or oftentimes they go out. I mean, I worked on a meteorite that someone went out to mow their yard one week, and the previous week there wasn't a rock there, and that week there was, and so they found a new meteorite. It happens all the time. Very cool. Thanks for all the awesome questions, and thanks for teaching us a thing or two about meteorites. Sure. So, Tim, is there one meteorite that has been studied more than the rest? Yeah. So this is a meteorite called Allende. Now, uh, by now, a lot of you are thinking, well, gee, the meteorites don't fall as these like flat plates like this, do that they? I mean, look, that's kind of weird looking. A little like right? Texas. Yeah, this one looks a lot like Texas. <laughs> Hi to anyone out there in Texas. So, but no, we cut them into these shapes. So this is a meteorite called Allende. It fell in Mexico in February of 1969. Now, do you remember what famous thing happened in planetary science in 1969? Now, I wasn't born yet, but I do think that that was the man on the moon. That's right. July 20th, 1969, they landed on the moon. So by February, they had been built all the laboratories that were going to study the rocks, but they didn't really have much to work on. And then this fell in 1969. This is a really special meteorite. It has chondrules in it again, these little round things that we talked about before, but it has things even older than the chondrules. So if we flip this around, you can see this little white thing here, well, right there. This is called a calcium aluminum inclusion. And if chondrules were little melted drops in the solar nebula, these were like your little dust bunnies. <laughs> Some of them were never melted. So little dust bunnies of the solar system. And these are 4.567 billion years old. Wow. Billion with a B. So this is the, probably the oldest thing that I am ever going to encounter in my life. This is the oldest thing life. in the Smithsonian. The oldest thing you'll ever hold, the oldest thing you'll ever see. And it formed when these little chondrules started sticking together. So you can see here, this is a process we called accretion. And so things get swept up and stick together. Now, 4.567 billion years ago, this is like a time machine. So if you like the DeLorean from Back to the Future or the hot tub time machine <laughs> or maybe the H.G. Wells time machine from the Big Bang Theory, you know, you can actually see it. And then collisions start to break these apart. But some of these survived. And what's really cool is you can actually take a little bit of this rock, if I break a little piece off of there, I could actually dissolve that up in a strong acid and be left with diamonds tiny little diamonds, only a few hundred carbon atoms. One scientist described them as if amoebas gave each other engagement rings. Those would be the perfect <laughs> diamonds. But those diamonds didn't even form in the solar system. They formed during the violent deaths of other stars. So when stars exploded, went supernova and red giant, they created those diamonds. So you might be holding pieces of 50 different stars that were light years apart, a billion years before our own solar system, right here in this one rock. So this one rock, is. can you say that this one rock, it holds all of the elements necessary for life and anything else that we know on It Earth? does. So if you think of the elements that make up life, you need carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, nitrogen, phosphorus, and sulfur. Those are the life-forming elements. All of those are found in this rock. And found, in fact, all of the elements of everything you've ever known are found in here. So if you took everything you've ever known, your favorite place to go, like maybe you like going to the Grand Canyon, your house, your pet, you know, everything you've ever eaten in your car and you put it all in a big blender and you went eh, and ground it all up <laughs> and then you dried it out and made a rock, all of that stuff would be in here. So there's gold in here and platinum and all those elements that form life. And so our directors have been quoted as saying that this is, if you, the museum were burning down and you could only save one thing, this may be the thing you want to save because this rock is really the stuff that made up our planet. Wow, so this holds the recipe. So this rock is extremely important. So has it inspired scientists to study the cosmos? It has, because we wanted to know what the composition of the solar system is. We can look at a rock like this, but most of the stuff is in the sun. Now you think, well, we can't go sample the sun. That'd be crazy, right? But the sun gives off this solar wind, and so we sent a spacecraft called Genesis. This is an artist concept of Genesis, and it collected bits of that solar wind that impacted the spacecraft brought it back to Earth so we could actually measure the composition of the sun and compare it to the composition of a meteorite like this. So because of the questions we're asking in here, we're flying spacecraft, half a billion dollar missions in order to answer those questions. Have any other meteorites inspired spacecraft missions? Yeah, so let's look at this one. This is a meteorite called Zagami. It fell in Nigeria in 1962. And maybe we can get a close up of that. And if you look at this rock, Okay, 
This part that's important is this little bit right here, that little black pocket right there. That now, you to can me, make that out. doesn't look like much. It doesn't look like much. No, it's not too impressive, is it? But imagine that this rock was sitting wherever it was, and it was having a day. We don't know if it was a good day or a bad day. It's a rock. And something <laughs> hit the surface, and a shock wave passed through and melted that little bit. If you pluck that out and you measure the nitrogen, remember we all breathe lots of nitrogen every day, 80% of the air is nitrogen, and the noble gases, you may not know the noble gases, helium, neon, argon, krypton, xenon, and radon. If you measure those, they're almost a dead match for those measured in the Martian atmosphere by the Viking lander in 1976. So even though we've never brought a rock back from Mars, we have Martian samples in our laboratory. So that we this can right study. here is a piece of Mars. This is a piece of Mars. So I'm holding a piece of Mars. Now, my favorite game when I was a kid, I was born in 1964, so Sesame Street came on the air in 1969. So I was the first generation of school age kids who played my favorite game, which one of these is not like the others? <laughs> so which one of these is not like the others? This one is not like the others. And how, Maggie, do we know this is not like the others? This comes in its own saucer. It does. It comes in its own flying saucer. That's how we know it's a special rock. But this Martian meteorite is four billion years old. It survived the warm, wet period on Mars. We think water flowed across the surface of Mars and has minerals in it that formed by water. So 20 years ago, scientists argued that this rock, Allen Hills 84001, actually contained evidence of past life on Mars. Really controversial finding. People still debate that a lot. But it launched probably 10 spacecraft to Mars because suddenly we wanted to know, could environments exist that hosted life on Mars. And, and you worked on some of those spacecraft missions. I did, missions. I did. So I worked on missions called um, Spirit and Opportunity, the Mars Exploration Rovers. And so we actually drove these rovers around the surface of Mars. Here you can see an animation. This is called the Rock Abrasion Tool. It's actually like a little grinding device that we can use to grind into the surface to see fresh rock. And so I spent five years helping to operate these on the surface of Mars. What's it like driving one? I can imagine it's kind of exciting. You would think so, but it's more like watching paint dry. <laughs> so uh, what you're really doing is you're writing a complex computer program every day, and you send that up to the spacecraft, and you say, go do this, and then it does all that, and then it writes back to us. Now, you'd probably think, man, you're really like covering a lot of Mars. You're doing a lot of stuff. I mean, here we can see some Exploring some a new frontier. Oh, yeah, really. I mean, going out there. So you'd think this is super exciting. So how fast do you think the Mars rover can actually go? That's a really good question. You actually, think, you think we should ask the... I think that's a good idea. Okay, let's see what they think. Yeah. Viewers, here's another opportunity to participate in a live poll with us. This poll appears to the right of your video screen. Tell us, how fast can a Mars rover go? 1,000 miles per hour, 100 miles per hour, 10 miles per hour, 1 mile per hour, or 0.1 mile per hour? Take a moment to think about it and put your answer in the window to the right. All right, Tim, we're both watching it. Yeah. We can see yeah. that one mile an hour and 0.1 mile an hour, it's a toss up depending yeah. on what it's coming in. And you got some people thinking 10 miles per hour too. So um, I don't know, why don't we take a look? Let's see how fast the thing really goes. <laughs> so this is an engineering model at the Jet Propulsion Lab. And this is- Is it moving? Yeah, this is top speed. <laughs> so on a really good day, the thing will move about 100 meters. And that takes about two or three hours to do. So what's a uh, hundred meters is a sixteenth of a mile per hour, about a thirtieth of a mile. So even the 0.1 mile per hour is way too fast for how we go. <laughs> to put it another way, we thought the rover was only designed to last 90 days on Mars. Okay, it's actually lasted 13 years. One of the two has lasted 13 years and it finally finished a standard marathon distance, 26.2 miles. Wow. So imagine it, what takes you, I don't know, really good run on Earth, three, four hours, takes 13 years for us to do with this thing on Mars. But remember, the spacecraft costs a half a billion dollars. So you have to be really careful with it because you don't want to make the people at NASA or up in Congress mad that you wrecked their rover. So at half a billion dollars, for each rover, yeah. why actually send these rovers to Mars? Why don't we just study the meteorites that come from them? Really good question, because when we take a meteorite like Zagami here, we have a rock from Mars, but what we don't have is the context for that rock. We don't actually know where this rock came from on Mars oh. or how it's related to all the other rocks. So it's the equivalent of going, for example, to the city dump 
and someone hands you 12 random rocks and says, oh, can you explain the geology of the Earth? Well, of course you can't. You need to know that context. So when we fly spacecraft missions, sometimes we're looking for new kinds of rocks, and sometimes we want the context for rocks we already have. So are there any missions currently planned? Yeah, there's one called OSIRIS-REx that I work on. It's run out of the University of Arizona, but it's going to visit an asteroid. Remember we talked about Allende, which is a carbonaceous chondrite. This is going to go visit an even more primitive type of carbonaceous chondrite. Where we don't just have the elements that help to make up life, but some of those molecules that combined in special ways to make up life. And so this, this mission we've been working on for 10 years. It's going to launch next year. It's going to get to the asteroid in 2019, return in 2023. And if you're out there watching and you're in, say, 7th or 8th grade, you still have time to go to high school and college and graduate school, get a postdoc, and then actually be one of the people to study these samples. Because we're going to still be working on these in 2030. And so you have the chance to be involved in things that, you know, these missions last 20 or 30 years, and you can be involved in one of them. Wow, that's awesome. Tim, this has been so fascinating. I loved getting the opportunity to learn about meteorites and the spacecraft missions that you've worked on. Thank you so much for being here. Sure, happy to be here. Can you tell our viewers where they can learn a little bit more? Sure. You can go to the Mineral Sciences website where we have more information about meteorites. And of course, if you're ever in Washington, D.C., come by the Smithsonian. We have a great exhibit of meteorites. You can go to the Jet Propulsion Lab, which is the home of the Mars rover, and they have information on all the missions they run out of there, a lot of which were based on questions asked by meteorites. Awesome. Thank you so much. Oh, glad to be here. And thank you, viewers, for all of your awesome questions. If you want to see this broadcast later this evening, it'll be archived at curious.si.edu. Thanks for watching. We hope you'll join us for the next season of Smithsonian Science How, starting this fall. Check out our schedule and register for upcoming shows on our website, curious.si.edu. bringing on what is a model of a really amazing application of atomic time. This is a model of the global positioning system. It consists of 24 satellites constantly orbiting the Earth, such that wherever you are on the Earth, you have four satellites above you. Now each of these satellites contains an atomic clock and they're all synchronized. So if you were to measure the signals, the time signals given out by the four satellites that are nearest you, and compare the time taken for that signal to reach you from these four satellites, very much like in, this history, in the story of navigation of Harrison, you could use time to actually measure and determine your position on the Earth. And that's exactly what one of these receivers does. It picks up the signal from these atomic clocks orbiting the Earth in the satellites. Now, Elia is up on the roof. Can you hear me, Elia? I can, Neil. Great. What have you got well, on I've the got screen? I've got the GPS receiver here in my hands, and you can see on the display, it's telling me my position at the moment is 51 degrees, 30.571 minutes north of the equator and 8 degrees, 0.564 west of Greenwich. Can you show us how many satellites? Yes, I've got other screens on here which also show us where we are. You see it's got a map of the world built in, so it's telling us we're somewhere near Westminster. And this screen tells us we're picking up signals from six satellites. Now, Elia, can you move across the roof so we can actually see the change? And this change is going to be very small but the change in the readings on right. the receiver. Let's try that. Yes, Neil, I think you can see quite clearly that the upper display is now saying 0.579 
degrees north. Before it was 0 0.570, so only that tiny movement across the roof, this has picked up. Well, that's wonderful. Thank you very much, Elia. In fact, this positioning, this ability to detect position on the Earth has an enormous number of applications. You may have seen some of the applications discussed for motorists, but also applications for sight-disabled people. And even, probably for some more surprising customers, sheep are big purchasers of GPS systems. <laughs> well, in fact, not the sheep themselves, of course, but the farmer who has to look after them. Because imagine, we're up in the hills, it's raining, got lots of sheep, they're all over the place. You don't really want to be out looking where they are. And your dog refuses to go. <coughs> so just strap one of these receivers to one of the backs of the sheep. Sit at home, cup of tea. And you monitor the position. Hello, my name is Jeremy Perez. I'm a graphic artist and amateur astronomer living in Flagstaff, Arizona, in the southwestern US. I sketch my observations because it helps me to see better. It helps me understand the amazing things I do see and it allows me to share the wonderful views with others. There are so many great astronomical objects to choose from and different ways to sketch them, I had a difficult time deciding what to demonstrate. I hope you'll like my choice of these two spectacular galaxies, M81 and M82 in Ursa Major as you can see in this deep sky survey image. Here are some materials you will need to create a sketch of these two galaxies. The clipboard, blank paper or an observing form, pencils, a red observing light, an eraser, a blending stump. This is a stick of rolled paper that's used to blend soft features. Some other useful tools are a pencil sharpener, an eraser shield to make precise deletions, a sanding block to sharpen a blending stump or to sharpen a pencil tip, and a kneaded rubber eraser to softly remove graphite. So that can be a lot to hold on to at the telescope. If you put clips on your pencils and your blending stump, or if you use mechanical pencils with clips, you can attach them to your clipboard or to a carpenter's clip magnet. Your observing light can hang from your neck or you can hold it in your hand or you can attach clamps to hold it to the clipboard. When sketching, try to be seated so you can concentrate and enjoy the observing session. Warm clothing and fingerless gloves will really help you to stay comfortable. And now, onto the sketch. Try starting with a sketch circle that is 8 to 12 centimeters in diameter. This will represent the field stop of your eyepiece. Begin by sketching the brighter stars that you see. Imagine the face of a clock in the eyepiece and on your sketch paper. Use this to estimate star positions. Once you finish the brighter stars, take a minute to mark the position of the galaxies. To do this, use a soft, dark pencil to scribble a graphite patch somewhere outside the sketch. Then, take a blending stump and brush it in this patch to pick up some of the graphite. Use the stars you drew to estimate the position of the galaxy's centers. Then, use the blending stump to dab them onto the sketch. Now use a lighter touch with the pencil to add fainter stars. Use the stars you already drew as guides. 
Imagine shapes such as triangles to help you see where to place these faint stars. If you notice any mistakes, you can use your eraser to delete them. Now it's time to shade the galaxies themselves. Brush your blending stump in the graphite patch and then transfer that to the sketch. Start with M81 by lightly shading its large elliptical shape. Refill your blending stump at the graphite patch and keep adding graphite to the galaxy to show the forms you see at the eyepiece. A kneaded rubber eraser is a very useful tool to help your shaded areas look just the way you want. You can mold it into any shape you need and then dab it to gradually remove the graphite. You can also lightly apply graphite with your pencil to carefully shape the structure of the galaxy. Keep touching it up with pencil, blending stump, and kneaded rubber eraser until it matches what you see in the eyepiece. Now you can use the same techniques with the thin shape of M82. Your pencil will be a very useful tool for drawing the lumpy structure within the body of this fascinating galaxy. Now that you are finished with both galaxies, compare the sketch to the eyepiece view and use a dark, soft pencil to make the brighter stars even bolder. When you're finished, you can scan your sketch and use an image editing program such as Adobe Photoshop to invert the drawing into a positive image. If you haven't sketched your observations before, I hope you will give it a try the next time you are out under the stars.
One thing that's really important here is these legs, and in particular these feet, because this is another really special adaptation uh, that we see in tyrannosaurs. And this goes by the magnificently tongue-twisting name of the Arctometatarsalian condition. I know, it's lovely. Um, but actually, it's really worth having a word like that because it's easier to say Arctometatarsalian, or at least when it is when you've said it quite a few times, than it is to say that special condition where the weird metatarsal is kind of shrunk at one end but wide at the bottom and it's kind of pinched between the other two and it changes how the foot functions. Because that's what it means. Um, but Arctometatarsalian is actually easier. So, if we look at a Tyrannosaurus foot, this is the foot from a nearly complete or a nearly full size Tyrannosaurus. It's a right foot. Um, so, you have four toes. The first toe, what for us, um, sorry, it yeah, um, sticks out at the back a little. Um, so, it's almost like the dew claw that you get on a cat or a dog. And then three walking toes. And these are the metatarsals, the bane of the footballer. We're all forever hearing about broken metatarsals. So we walk on the flats of our feet. We have both our toes on the ground and we have our metatarsals on the ground. We walk across the whole foot. The dinosaurs and indeed the birds and many other animals just walk on the toes. So they've elevated the foot and they have the metatarsals, or in the case of my hand, metacarpals, suspended, if you like, upright. And this actually already automatically kind of extends the length of the leg. It gives you a longer leg to run on. So this is actually going to speed you up, because it means you're taking longer steps for every pace. But if we look to the middle, what you'd see on most dinosaurs, in fact, the vast majority of them, in particular the carnivores, is the three metatarsals for the three running toes would all look like this. They'd be lovely long big blocks, nice vertical strips. But we see here, this middle one kind of vanishes, and it's being crushed between the other two, and it looks like it's kind of disappeared and like it's going to come out the back. But actually it doesn't. It really is being crushed, and we can see that if we could switch back up to the slides. There we go. So here it is. This is just the middle one. And you can see the, the top just kind of vanishes. It just absolutely disappears. I've actually got a real one here. So this is on loan from the Royal Terrell Museum in Alberta. It's actually from another dinosaur. It's not actually a tyrannosaur, but two or three different groups all evolved an arctometatarsal. And you can see here, totally crushed in. This is where the other two would attach. And if that shows up, okay, you can see the cross-section. It's this tiny squished triangle. So it really has completely crushed, effectively, that middle toe, or that, that sorry, that middle, middle metatarsal. And this is actually a really interesting feature because this totally changes how the foot moves. If you can imagine you want to be a long-distance runner, every time you hit the ground, every time you take a step, um, your bones are all slightly moving. And that represents lost energy. Because if they don't, what you actually tend to do is start compressing some of your ligaments and some of your joints. And as you step off again, that springs back and you get a little bit of energy back. So what you really want to do is to minimize all of the movement. You want to have everything as firmly and tightly together as possible, because every little bit of movement is just wasted energy. And if you do this with a lovely big wavy bone up the middle, with two bones locking it in either side, you're effectively holding the whole foot together. And when we're talking about an animal that might be six or so tons, every single footstep can potentially lose a lot of energy with the bones just seesawing either side of each other and you having to hold them together. If you lock them up into a single block, that doesn't happen. Some of that energy will then go into your joints and you'll get it back on the next step. And so this is an adaptation that we see in three or four groups of dinosaurs, and they're all long-distance runners. They were all very efficient over long distances. They usually have very long legs, a light build, they have a relatively short thigh bone, which allows them to move the legs repeatedly, and that makes them both quick and efficient over long distances. So despite the fact that a full-sized Tyrannosaurus was clearly a very bulky animal, they were also pretty fast. The estimates... Speed estimates are really difficult for an animal that's been dead for 65 million years, for which we have no muscles. But, bearing all of that in mind, 
something like a full-size Tyrannosaurus was probably reaching speeds comparable to an Olympic sprinter. Only the difference is, this is an animal which isn't specialized for sprinting, it's specialized for long-distance running. So it's holding that speed, probably for quite a considerable period of time. You could not outrun this animal. <laughs> no chance. <laughs>